This is Takeoff Book. The third book of Take series, written by Evelyn Sola. Present by Hannah Suki. Living with fear stops us taking risks, and if you don't go out on the branch, you're never going to get the best fruit. Sarah Parrish. Vicky. I am done with men. I like my life the way it is. Calm, quiet, and very private. I may be a brash New Yorker, but I keep a tight circle, and I prefer it that way. Enter Colt Chastain, rising NBA star and magnetic single dad. He set his sights on me and he's determined to change my mind. No way that's going to happen. Nope. Never. Did I mention he's tenacious? And hot. Very, very hot. I told him he's the absolute last man I would ever be with. So, why does he think getting me into bed is a slam dunk? I tried to resist. I really did. My efforts didn't work, and now I've found myself falling head over heels for him. Did I say quiet and private? I'll even accept the crazy public lifestyle. Now, I can't picture my life without him and his adorable five-year-old son. Col Colt. I live my life in the spotlight. Millions of fans, social media, and press follow me everywhere. That's not my preference. That comes with the job. On the inside, I'm a regular southern gentleman who can't fight my attraction to the tempting New Yorker who's caught my eye. Victoria Taylor is everything I ever wanted. She's beautiful, sexy, confident, and not afraid to put me in my place. She says she doesn't want me, but her eyes tell a different story. I'll stop at nothing to prove to her that we're really not that different after all. 1. Colt I had my heart in my throat the entire fourth quarter. Why, I practically fainted three times. Mama, always the dramatic one. I let out a chuckle and continue listening to her voicemail. She's done this since my first year in the NBA. If she's not at the game, she'll leave voicemail messages throughout. Most of them praising me and anointing me as the best basketball player of all time and a few criticizing my form or accusing me of hogging the ball. But I knew. I just knew that my baby would win the game for his team. Son, I don't think I breathed for a full five minutes. When Law took the ball and scored that three-pointer, I thought that was it. And on she goes, giving me a verbal replay of the last quarter. The one I just played. But when he tried to fake you out, you showed him who's boss. Her enthusiasm is infectious, and I smile at myself in the mirror. Yeah, I sure did show them. I scored the last shot of the game. A three-pointer that gave us the win by one. One measly point, but that's all you need to win. Oh, your brother showed me how to use the Twitter. Make sure you follow me back. And I can't wait to have you home this summer. Maybe you and Robin can finally connect. But if that doesn't happen, there's someone else I want to introduce you to. I end and delete the message after that. For someone who has chosen to remain single since my father died, she's doing everything she can to find me a mate. Once was enough, but I do go and follow her on Twitter. When I step outside, the usual crowd is waiting for us. Some are family members of the team, but most are fangirls. Attractive women, dressed in their finest and hoping to go home with one of us. It's more prevalent at away games, but the single guys are never shy about finding a warm body to spend the night with, especially after a win. You coming, Chasty? Wachowski, one of my younger teammates shouts from across the parking lot. He's with three women, two of them wrapped around each arm. The third is standing in front of him, trying to get his attention. No, you go ahead. And it's Chastain, not Chasty. Chasty Chastain is a nickname given to me by Wachowski because I don't sleep with everything female. One of the women, a pretty blonde, pouts. Okay, Chasty Chastain. A few of the guys guffaw at the joke, but I don't react. Truth is, I hate that name. And it's untrue. 
When I first got into the league, I was with my fair share of women, until Kelsey came to New York and got pregnant with our son. I shake my head, unwilling to let those thoughts take over. It's done. She died, and I keep her memory alive for the benefit of my son. Who are you kidding? You do it for the benefit of everyone who thought your marriage was perfect. I cross through the parking lot, all the while getting pats on the back by Coach Walsh. His hands are like bricks on my shoulder. As a former professional basketball player, he stands at almost seven feet tall, but since he's been out of the league, he's been lifting weights. He doesn't look like any of the other coaches. He has long, dirty blonde hair that reaches his shoulders, and I know that underneath that custom-made suit, he's tatted all over. Ignore those fools and go home to your son, Coach Walsh says. Nice save, Chastain, someone yells just as my driver opens the door to my car. I sit back on the plush leather of my Mercedes. It's one of the few luxuries I allow myself. Expensive cars and luxurious homes for me and my son. And the best education that money can buy for Evan, so he won't have to depend on a sports scholarship like I did. When he grows up, he won't be responsible for taking care of his extended family. It's a short ride from Madison Square Garden to my building in Central Park. I thank my driver and nod at my doorman on the way inside. He stands to the side, and I can tell he's holding his breath and waiting. I stop, chuckle, and pull the basketball out of my bag. Without asking, he hands me a sharpie. I scribble my signature and toss the ball in the air. He quickly grabs it and yells out a thank you. My apartment is eerily quiet when I walk in. Marta, my son's nanny, turns off the telenovela when she notices me. Welcome home, Mr. Colt. Her Spanish accent is as thick as her waist and her glasses. Good game tonight. Thanks, Marta, I say with a smile. I walk to the kitchen and grab a bottle of water while she puts on her shoes. She lives several floors down in a smaller unit I bought a few years ago. I invest in real estate. That was the advice given to me by a close friend. Buy during a buyer's market and hold on to it. Pass it down to your kids, but if you need to, you can always sell it. The only problem is there is never a buyer's market in Manhattan, but when your contract pays $300 million over four years, you can afford whatever you want. Marta lets herself out, and I peek inside Evan's bedroom. My five-year-old is in the middle of the bed in his race car pajamas. The covers are off, and his butt is sticking up in the air like it did when he was a baby. I sit next to him and run a hand through his curly hair. That's the one thing he got from me. Other than that, he's his mother's spitting image. From his pale coloring to his dark eyes and his full lips. He stirs and I put the blanket on him and tiptoe out of the room. By the time I shower and eat the meal my chef prepared, I'm ready for bed and already feeling the effects of tonight's game. My legs are exhausted, and my shoulders are tight. Tomorrow's session with my personal trainer and masseuse can't come soon enough. I step inside the master bedroom and imagine it's bigger than the small house I grew up in right outside of Birmingham, Alabama. My parents were working-class people both working at a meat processing plant until my father died of a sudden heart attack when I was 13. Despite our lack of material things, we were a happy household. My older brother was a star athlete and made varsity on the basketball team when he was a sophomore. We were the type of family who ate together each night. Mama's always been a great cook. We'd go to church together on Sunday and had Bible study every Wednesday. Although we didn't have money for extras, we had everything we needed. The night our daddy died was the beginning of the end of a lot of things, none of which I want to think of right now. Tonight, I'll review the game and how I pulled out a win at the last second. I'll think about how a young boy from a small town has made good. I won't think about the bad side of that. I won't think about the loneliness and isolation that I've lived with for the last nine years. No one ever thinks about that part of it. Everyone thinks fame and fortune only bring about the best. The best that money can buy. 
The best vacations. The best food. The best of everything, but you can't buy loyalty. You can't buy friends, and you can't pay family not to try and ruin your career before it begins. No amount of money can erase the pain caused by the ones you love the most. The ones you trusted. But everything has a season, son. I can hear my mother's words. Her southern twang thickening with every excited breath. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Yeah, I'm free. Through no act of my own. Fate took my wife when she overdosed on heroin, setting me free from a marriage I never should have been in. Despite my issues with Kelsey, she loved our son. And she loved her daughter, too. The one she had by another man after I left Alabama. I broke her heart when I left for college, and she tried to mend it in the arms of another. While she went and married before she turned twenty, having a child before she was barely old enough to drink, I spent my time as a single man sleeping with fangirls. That was my only vice. I don't drink. I don't gamble. I don't even curse. The only difference between me and my teammates is that I was discreet, and they aren't. But when you have young men with more money than they can spend, they're going to indulge in a vice. Mine was sex. But that was then. It only lasted until Kelsey broke up with her husband, and Mama told her where to find me. As discreet as I was back then, there were still rumors and innuendo. There were also a few photos, so as soon as Kelsey was free, Mama bought her a plane ticket to New York City and demanded I see her. She was familiar. I'd known her almost my entire life. She was my best friend when Daddy died, and her entire family supported us. When she got to Manhattan, feelings resurfaced. It was like having a piece of home in New York City, which was like a different planet than my quiet, conservative hometown. Nothing was off-limits here. The city never shut down, and I had everything I could want at my fingertips. No twenty-year-old man who had hardly ever been anywhere could resist and as much as celibacy was pushed on me growing up, I forgot all about that when I got here. Kelsey got pregnant with Evan four months into our relationship, a long-distance one at that. We were married months later, and for a time, things were good. Until they weren't. I had no idea Kelsey had a drug problem until it was too late, but I got my son out of it, and for that, I don't regret our relationship. The reasons we shouldn't have married have nothing to do with her addiction. I just wish I knew sooner so I could have gotten her help. Instead of sleeping like I should be, I watch the game again, taking mental notes on what I can improve on, but for now, I'll celebrate tonight's win. When I reach for the cold pillow next to me, I'm hit by a sudden bout of loneliness. The love you have for a child can do wondrous things, but it can't fill the deep void of emptiness inside the kind that can only be fulfilled by another adult human being. The kind you can hold, kiss, and make love to on a night like tonight. The kind who would wait up for you to get home and jump in your arms when you walk through the door. The kind who will celebrate your wins and mourn your losses along with you. I never had that with Kelsey. Looking back, I was a means to an end. I was her ticket out of Alabama, and she seized it. When Daddy died, Mama never dated when we were still living with her. She's still a beautiful woman, and back then, she got lots of offers. She still does, but she said her free time was only going to her sons, and she held firm. There was no string of men coming through our house. We continued to eat together each night, have Bible study every Wednesday, and church on Sunday. The only difference was that Daddy was no longer there. His chair sat empty at the head of the table, and Mama never disrespected his memory by offering that seat to another person. I need to do the same for my son. He needs consistency, but more than that, he needs me. I'm reluctant to bring someone new into his life, especially after it went so horribly the one time I tried. But knowing that doesn't stop the loneliness from creeping in on me on a late night when half of my California king bed remains empty and cold. 2. Vicky. Victoria, it's your mother. 
the one who gave birth to you. Remember her? I feel like I've been trying to get up with you for weeks. Can you please give your mother a call? The mother who gave you life. And you'll never guess who I bumped into the other day. Call me and I'll tell you all about it. The call ends, and I pout as I add Russian red lipstick to my lips. Way to be subtle, mother. Like I don't know the difference between her and my evil stepmother. As if I need her to remind me that she's the woman who left her family, and my stepmother is the one who came in two years later and kept us all together. I know the difference. I lived it as a child, and I carry it with me every single day. I delete her message and look at my reflection in the mirror, pleased with what I see. I add a little mascara to my smoky eye look. The rouge on my cheeks is subtle, so subtle it's barely noticeable. The brownness of my skin only enhances my red lips, making them look fuller. My black skirt might be short, but my lacy red top is ruched, hiding the slight bulge of my stomach. My goal, starting next week, is to get back into yoga and pull back on the carbs. But for tonight, I'll drink wine and eat whatever I want. I pick up my phone, FaceTime my sister, and wait for her to accept my call. I laugh when I see flower on her face. She blows a breath upward, and her bangs bounce on her forehead. Hey! Just supervising the best sleepover in the history of the world. I hear giggles and the sounds of kids talking. I don't think anyone can outdo our evil stepmother when it comes to hosting the best sleepovers. I think back to my preteen years at home with my father and stepmom. She never said no to us having friends over, and she not only allowed sleepovers, but she planned them and entertained our friends. She'd help us prepare a menu, make elaborate appetizers and entrees, and let us stay up late into the night watching movies. Just watch me, Tara says. And you look hot. Who's the guy? Her boyfriend, a single father, stands behind her and waves. She turns and looks up adoringly at him. He bends down and kisses her. Hey! Enough of that, now. Tara looks back, not looking the least bit guilty about ignoring me to kiss her man. If I had a man as sexy as Ethan Bradford, I'd kiss him too. I was calling to invite you two out to dinner with me and friends, but I see you have your hands full. They are both casually dressed, and my sister looks like she can use a hot shower to wash the flower away. No, you weren't. You're wearing your date lipstick. I stick my tongue out at her. She knows me well. The Russian red only comes out when it's a hot date. You got me. When Ethan walks away, I lower my voice and say, Your mother has been calling me non-stop. Why? She shrugs. Our mother, she reminds me. She's trying to arrange a brunch or a spa date of some sort. She got me this afternoon just as I was leaving the office. I roll my eyes, but I know mother won't stop until she gets what she wants. She complained about not getting Alan on the phone too. My twin brother Alan has been at a conference for the last few days. He's been too busy to take even my calls and we always answer each other's calls. But I know when he talks to her, he'll agree to whatever she wants. Once he does, she will enlist him to convince me and Tara. What did you tell her? I ask my sister. I told her I'd get back to her. I can't deal with this tonight. I need to be in Midtown in an hour. Yeah, you look too fabulous to waste staying in. A small child calls her name, and my sister turns around. I lose her for a second, but when she returns, she's holding a little boy in her arms. Vincent, Ethan's son, waves and giggles. He's a sweet kid with spiky, dirty blonde hair and wire-rimmed glasses. Tara kisses his cheek, and he pretends to hate it, but he lets out a loud belly laugh. He wiggles, and she puts him down. Okay, lady. I'll let you get back to your evening. If you talk to your mother before I do, tell her I've been sick. Um, you know I can never keep my story straight when I lie, and don't dump her on me. She's our mother. We end the call, and I open my Uber app. 
One more dab of lipstick later, I grab my fitted black leather jacket, but just as I reach the door, my phone rings. I pull it out of my clutch. It's my mother. Having had enough of dodging her, I answer the phone. Mother, I say. I let out an exaggerated, rushed breath and hope she gets the hint. Is that my daughter? The one I carried with her twin brother? Do you know I gained over 100 pounds with you too? After that, I said never again, but your father would have kept going if. One I roll later, I decide to cut her off. Mother, I've heard this a million times before. I'm on my way out the door. Can I call you tomorrow? I have my hand on the doorknob, ready to walk out and get on with my night. I'll make it quick. Guess who I ran into? No idea, but hurry up and tell me before my Uber gets here. I put her on speaker and check the app. My car is still seven minutes away, but she doesn't need to know the details. He showed up at my job like a ghost. I almost fell over on my behind when I saw him. I thought I was seeing things. Never, ever one to get to the damn point. Uh, huh. Does this ghost of Christmas past have a name? And why do I give a flying fuck is the better question, but she's going to drag this out until I end the call. Don't you have friends to go out with tonight? You always do. I add that in for effect, but she doesn't react. Your ex-boyfriend, that's who? Dr. Gerald Prescott. And he's still tall, dark, and handsome. Now, that surprises me. That's the last thing I expected to hear from my mother's mouth, and it's a name I haven't thought about in a long time, but four years ago, he was a big part of my life. Oh, Vicky, you should see him. Why did he come see you? I ask her. Why do you think, she whispers and giggles like an excited schoolgirl. Men don't get over the women in my family. I don't remind her how untrue that is. Dad got over her and moved on. She's the one who's never fully moved on from him, despite being the one who walked out of the marriage. Did he ask you out on a date? I ask, pretending not to know what she means. She lets out a long, exaggerated sigh. Stop playing dumb. He's looking for you. Asked me for your phone number, but I told him I'd have to ask you first. I furrow my brows. What she's saying makes absolutely zero sense. Mother, I've had the same number since I got my first cell phone at 12. Why would he need to track you down and ask you for it? I made that same point, but he says he thought you had changed your number because he can't get in touch with you. I let out a groan and wish I never bothered to pick up the phone. For more minutes until my car gets here. Now that I think about it, I know why he can't get in touch with me. I remember now. I blocked him. It happened about a year after he left. The relationship ended when he was accepted into a residency program, and I refused to go to Kentucky with him. I was a senior in college, and he was in his last year of medical school. He had spent a good chunk of his senior year traveling for residency interviews, and he found out he was accepted into Kentucky in the spring, the same week I was hired for my first job. After telling him I wouldn't be moving with him, he gave me an ultimatum. I called his bluff. Well, he's back and even more handsome than before. He had his one chance, mother. She scoffs. He's a doctor, Vicky. And you both were so young. Maybe the separation was a good thing. You two are older and wiser now. So, where are you going tonight? Relieved by the change of subject, I give her the name of the Midtown restaurant quickly followed by, my car's pulling up. I'll call you later. Anxious to get off the phone, I tell her goodnight. The ice cube in his red wine should have been my first clue, but like the lady that I am, I smile and pick up my own glass. It's a noisy Friday night at the Smith, a Midtown restaurant. My date, Draymond, a man who looks 10 years older and 50 pounds heavier than his online dating profile picture, adjusts himself in the seat for the 50th time. He clears his throat, looks at my breasts, and licks his lips. 
You're a very attractive girl, Victoria. I cringe, but I force a smile if only to hear what he has to say next. I've always had strong intuition, and I have the feeling that there's a but coming. But do you need all that makeup? I don't answer. I stare and raise both eyebrows and wait. Pretty girls don't need all that stuff. He waves his hand around as if that would erase all the stuff he disapproves of. Woman. What? He sips the wine, makes a face, and puts it down. He looks around the place, and I tell myself that if he asks for more ice, I will walk out of here right now. You called me a girl twice. I'm a woman. Haven't been a girl in a long time. His eyes return to my breasts, and he bites his bottom lip. Woman indeed. He says it so low that I barely hear it. He licks his lips and I resist the urge to gag. I pick up my wine glass and finish my drink before looking around the restaurant, packed with people having fun on a Friday night. I sigh in defeat. That won't be me tonight. At least not with this guy. You know you don't have to do all of this for me. He gestures toward me. What do you mean by all of this? I already know based on what he just said about my makeup, but I want to hear it from him. The makeup. The nail polish and the too tight shirt. I like my women simpler, more natural. There's a passage in Proverbs that says, Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. That was way more than I was expecting, but it always amazes me when scripture is quoted to control women. I flag the waiter and request another glass of wine. I'd take something stronger, but I need a clear head. But what if I like the makeup, nail polish, and too tight top? What if this, I gesture to myself the same way he just did a few minutes ago, is about me and not anyone else? Least of all you, you classless idiot. I bite my tongue. Unnecessary meanness is not one of my traits. He leans back in his chair and one of the buttons on his shirt pops. I want to point out that I'm not the one in the tight shirt, but my wine arrives, and I focus on that. He sighs dramatically. Don't do that. Don't be one of those. You women, he emphasizes the word, probably because I just called him out on it. You do all of this to get a man's attention and nobody can convince me otherwise. But that's okay, Victoria Taylor. You have my full attention. He pulls his body closer to the table. And I do like what I see. He raises himself and tries to look down my shirt. Idiot. It's sexy, but it has a high neck and there's nothing to look down. The waiter returns, and I order a bone and ribeye and a side of potatoes. I'll pay for this in the morning when I meet my personal trainer for the first time in six months, but for tonight, I'll indulge already thinking of the dessert I'm going to get to go. A nice slice of lemon cake with extra whipped cream. You know, if you're getting steak, you're going to have to put out. He masks the statement with a loud laugh, but I know he's serious. That's only for people who can't afford to pay their own way, Draymond. I give him my best fake smile, which he doesn't return. His eyes harden. I don't have that problem. To prove my point, I call the waiter back and ask for separate checks. I was only joking, he says after the waiter walks away. I'm not. I see you're one of those. He sighs, almost as if he's disappointed in me. One of what? Those independent types, but all you women do is use your pussy to try and manipulate and control. I lean against the table and look him in the eyes. I didn't realize my pussy was ever an option. Thanks for letting me know. He picks up his wine and swirls it around, but he doesn't drink it. Not a fan of wine. I ask, wanting to change the topic. No. And I don't like a woman who drinks. I can't stand to look at it. He glances at my glass and frowns. I put it to my mouth tilt my head back and down the remainder in one gulp. I dab the side of my mouth with my napkin. All done. You won't have to look at it anymore. Better? This isn't working out. 
No, I don't suppose it is, I admit. I shake my head sadly, doing my best to act disappointed. Why did you bother if you weren't going to try? Why did you? What part of me made you think it was okay to talk down to me? Or comment on how I look and how I should change it? You quoted scripture as if that would move me. I'm out of here. He grabs his wallet and pulls out a wad of cash. I'm sick of you New York bitches. He stands, and so do I. I call the waiter and tell him to pack my food to go and to bring it to me at the bar. You don't walk out on me, Draymond. You stand there and watch as I walk away from you. His nostrils flare as I point at his chest. I grab my clutch from the table and walk to the bar. I order a water and wait for my food. A few minutes later, my water glass is empty, but my food still hasn't arrived. Someone takes the stool next to me at the bar, and I smell familiar cologne. I tap my fingernails on the counter, no longer in the mood to be around people. I have visions of eating in bed and nothing but a t-shirt while I catch up on brainless television. Maybe I'll get a heads up and start grading the essays from my freshman. Victoria Taylor. Is that you? I freeze at the sound of the voice. It can't be, but it dawns on me why my mother was so interested in where I was going tonight. I walked right into her trap. I should have known, but I hadn't thought of Jerry in so long, I was thrown off balance. Mother liked Jerry a lot back then. She was over the moon that I was dating a future doctor. Jerry. I look at his face. He looks the same. Clear brown skin with full lips. He looks like he just got a fresh haircut today because his lining is perfect. He's in a button-down shirt and jacket with jeans. Nothing about him has changed. What a coincidence. I try to keep the sarcasm out of my voice. He smiles. Alone tonight? He looks around as if he's expecting someone to appear out of nowhere. I didn't tell mother I had a date, but I wonder if Jerry would still be here if I had. Just waiting for my dinner. I turn my body, giving him some of my back, hoping he'll take the hint and walk away just like he did before, but if he's seeking me out, he's not about to leave. You look good. I can feel his eyes on me. From the corner of my eye, I see him staring at my bare legs. He was always a sucker for my legs. Thank you. I swing my legs underneath my chair and put my clutch on my lap to shield his view. While I'm at it, I consider all the ways I'm going to kill my mother when I get my hands on her. I'm angrier at myself for falling into her trap so easily. You always liked this place. This is where you introduced me to your mom. My memory works fine, Jerry. In truth, I had forgotten about that little detail, but knowing him, he's giving it more significance than he should. I've been trying to call you. I take a deep breath and turn to face him. For what possible reason? I turn away, dismissing him before he can utter another word. I'm back in New York. Been back only a few weeks, and this city has always reminded me of you. I walked in here, and here you are. Must be fate. Yeah, because my mother set me up. Thankfully a server comes to the counter and puts a large brown paper bag in front of me. She puts the check down, and Jerry grabs it before I can reach for my wallet. I take it from him and hand it back along with my credit card. I know you've seen my mother. Stop pretending this is a coincidence, fate, or whatever bullshit you want to call it. Let's have dinner together. He leans close, invading me with the scent of his familiar cologne. I stand from my chair and take my bag. I don't understand why you're here and why you've been trying to call me. He stands too, towering over me. Mother was right, and I was wrong. He's changed quite a bit. He's filled out since the last I saw him. His shoulders are broader than I remember, but his smile is the same. It's the same one I went crazy for, but that was a long time ago. Where is your fiancé? I do my best to keep the sneer out of my voice. 
he looks surprised by my question, and for a brief moment, he seems embarrassed. Yes, Jerry. I received the engagement announcement you so graciously sent me. Remember that? It was a year to the date of our breakup. The one with the picture of where you proposed. He clears his throat, and I can practically see the color rising from his neck to his face. Jerry took her back to our old school, Duke University, and got on one knee right there in the Duke Gardens. The same place where he first told me he loved me. I always wondered if that was intentional. Did he do that because he planned on sending me his engagement announcement? Part of me still believes that. It didn't work out. I look at him up and down, offering no comment on his failed engagement. Unlike when I received the announcement, I feel nothing now. Not a twinge of jealousy, anger, or regret. A lot has happened since I was last in New York. Let's have dinner together and catch up. I don't think so. We said all we had to say. I got one chance. That's what you told me when we got together. Right. That was before you called me a bitch and an ice queen because I didn't respond the way you wanted to your ultimatum to upend my life and move to Kentucky. He closes his eyes, but when he opens them, I see a flash of anger. It passes quickly. Jerry never liked to be challenged or questioned. We were young and foolish, V. We both said a lot of things we shouldn't have, but I've never stopped thinking about you. He runs his knuckles along my cheek, and I step back. You can be an ice queen as long as I'm the one who makes you melt. I push his hand off my face, put on my jacket, and walk away, hoping he doesn't follow me. Once I get outside, I open the Uber app and request a car. Unfortunately, luck isn't on my side tonight. Jerry follows me outside. Look, Vicky. Stop. I'm not interested in going backwards. What did you add in the engagement announcement you sent? I think it was something along the lines of, it's nice to be with someone who's not made of ice. That's not what I said, and you know it. We both said a lot of things back then. And I already told you that Janelle and I broke up. My car pulls up, and I approach. Have a good life, Jerry. You had your one chance. He walks with me and holds the door open. Call me. He hands me a business card. My new number is on the back. I don't respond. When he lets go of the door, I close it and look straight ahead. This is it. I'm giving up dating for the indefinite future. Darkness stretches out in my apartment like a blanket. I turn on the light, leave my heels by the door and walk to my kitchen. The quiet is interrupted by my loud hiccup. I grab a bottle of water from the fridge and do my best to erase the taste of the wine and that uncomfortable scene with Jerry. I place my food on the table and walk to my bedroom to change. I emerge from my room in a yellow, faded t-shirt. My stomach growls, begging for food. And because this isn't how I planned the evening, I still want to make it special. So, I light a candle, put my food on my deceased grandmother's fine china, place it on a tray, take it to my room, and devour my juicy bone-in ribeye. It's a couple of hours later that I eat the decadent lemon cake and lie back on the bed with a full belly. It's barely 11 o'clock on a Friday night, and I'm lonely in a cold bed. My plan was to have a sexual walkabout this year. Just sex. No strings and no relationships, but I've learned there are always strings. And as much as I want to deny it to myself, I need a little bit more than just dinner and a drink before taking my clothes off for a man. I need a connection, and I haven't felt a spark with anyone in a long time. I didn't feel anything for Jerry tonight. He's the first man I ever loved and it took me a long time to get over him. I had started moving forward when I received his engagement announcement. It's as if he could sense I was getting over him and sent that announcement to fuck with me. His intentions were to hurt me, and he did, though he'll never know it. I set the engagement announcement on fire and never looked back. My phone vibrates on the bed next to me, and I pick it up, expecting my brother or sister, 
only to be disappointed when I see an unknown number. Assuming it's spam, I let the phone go to voicemail, and a few seconds later, I'm alerted that I have a new message. V, it's Jerry. Despite how things ended between us, it was nice seeing you tonight. This is my new number. I'd love to take you out to dinner sometime and catch up. A lot has happened since I've been away, and I want to tell you all about it. He lets out a deep breath before he continues. Sending you that engagement announcement was one of the stupidest things I've ever done. It's proof that I never got over you and that my engagement was doomed. Call me. I won't, but I don't delete the message. Jerry was a lifetime ago. Back when I was young, but not dumb enough to give up what I wanted to follow a man to a place I didn't want to go to. My entire life is here, and I was not willing to give it up. At least not for Jerry. Three. Vicky. Six hours after my mother leaves a voicemail, I decide to listen to it. Whatever she wants, there's nothing I can do about it now, but I'm sure her phone calls are for fishing purposes. I never called to give her a piece of my mind about Jerry. She's probably been waiting to hear from me for the past seven days. Jerry's not worth the effort, and mother doesn't deserve to know the details after that stunt. Knowing mother, it might have nothing to do with Jerry. You never know with her. It could be an impromptu invitation to do something in the city. That's how it always is. At best, she'll give me a couple of hours heads up, at worst, she'll be outside my apartment asking to be let in. For a busy Friday night, the bathroom at the 4040 Club is surprisingly quiet and empty. Just what I need as I slip into the last stall in the spacious bathroom and press the speaker button on my phone to listen to the voicemail. Hey, French Fry. I cringe at the nickname. She has one for each of us, all based on the foods we loved most when we were kids. I was hoping we could have dinner tonight. I can cook or we can go out. I talked to your sister earlier, but she has plans with Ethan. I'm going to book the three of us a spa day soon, for if I can convince your brother to come down for a weekend. I miss you guys. And I want to hear all about your night out last week. That quick conversation wasn't enough. Call me back. Love you. I hit delete and only feel a twinge of guilt at not listening to it earlier. Even though I didn't use the toilet, I flush before I walk out. As I'm at the sink washing my hands, Tamron, my good friend and fellow teacher, stumbles inside. There you are. There are NBA stars here tonight. She raises both hands up, swings her hips then sticks her butt out and twerks. Hard pass, but you go ahead. I add lipstick and dab at the corners of my eyes with concealer. I do not see the appeal of athletes at all. I make a face like I taste something sour. Good. More for me to choose from. Stay away. You're looking too fine tonight for your own good. She approaches the sink and runs her fingers through her hair. I try not to roll my eyes. My dad would be over the moon if he were here, but I'm certain he's at home on this Friday night with my evil stepmother, living their best lives. Dad got the best deal after he and my mother divorced. Well, after she left him and us. Why the hell are you staring off into space? Tamron waves a hand in front of my face and snaps her fingers. How do I look? She spins around in her tight black full leather pants and sparkly crop top. Fabulous. I'm going to see if I can get one of them to buy me a drink. She puts on burgundy lipstick and wiggles her brows at me through the mirror. And then who knows what else. She does a little shimmy with her shoulders. If a drink is all you want, I can buy it for you. No need to stroke some athlete's ego for an overpriced, watered-down cocktail. Unlike me who grew up with a successful businessman father in a big house and attended nothing but elite private schools, Tamron grew up in a two-bedroom apartment in Queens with five younger siblings. She still helps them out financially, and she counts every penny she spends. 
I'll take you up on that later if I fail, and girl, I don't plan to fail tonight. She fluffs her curly hair and gestures for me to follow her. There are a group of women circling a crowd of tall men when we step out of the bathroom. Come with me, Tamron begs, but I shake my head and point in the opposite direction. I'm going to get two drinks. Come and find me and bring the rest of our friends with you. I walk away, disgusted at the sight of women willing to embarrass themselves to get the attention of a man just because he's an athlete. I don't get very far before I spot my sister and her boyfriend. Tara drops his hand when she sees me, and the two of us run to each other like we've been apart for years. You can tell we're related, but she looks more like our dad whereas I take after my mom. And even though Alan is my twin, he looks more like Tara. She's two years older than us, putting her at eleven when our mother left. The three Taylor siblings were always close. South close I don't think we've ever had a serious argument, but our mother leaving drove us closer together. We formed a bond that nobody can break. After hugging her, I hug Ethan. There are rules my sister and I have when it comes to dating, and she's broken every single one of them to be with Ethan Bradford. Rule one is that we don't date men with kids, and Ethan is a single father with a bitch of an ex-wife. Rule two is my rule, but celebrities and athletes are out. I don't need to be in a relationship with a man and his ego. Ethan might not be a celebrity or athlete, but being the CEO of the world's largest discount chain makes him famous. He bought out my father's business, which was not the least bit welcome by my sister who worked for our father at the time. Regardless, I liked him for her the minute my eyes landed on him. He was so different from the type of guys she's always dated, it was comical. Look at New York's power couple. I stand between them and twine my arms through theirs. Ethan, your girlfriend's sister needs a drink. Ethan talks to a bouncer, and he opens a VIP section for us. Once we're seated, he kisses my sister and walks to the bar. How the hell did you get VIP access? I called you to meet me here less than an hour ago. Tara looks at me, shrugs, and we both burst into laughter. I get it. That's what happens when your man's a billionaire. You get all the good stuff. I'll try to remember you and my humble beginnings, dear sister. A bartender approaches with two bottles of Cristal. Despite all the NBA players in here, your man's the real MVP. We clink our glasses, and I down mine. Before I can bother to put my glass down, our personal waiter refills it. I love it here. If it's not VIP, it's not for me. That kind of rhymes. Should I put it on a t-shirt? My sister laughs at my antics, and I look for Tamron so she can join us, but I can't see her through the thick crowd hanging by the athletes. I look around the room, and the friends I came with are all congregating near the NBA players, taking selfies. I can't stand women who throw themselves at athletes, I whisper to my sister. We clink our glasses again in agreement. It's like you're dating two people. The guy and the giant chip on his shoulder. Oh, and let's not forget the fangirls. Those guys can't keep it in their pants for nothing. Well, let's not generalize. Don't lump them together like that. A lot of them are family men. While our server pours us another drink, another brings out platters of food. My eyes light up and my stomach growls at the platter of mini tacos placed in front of us. You'll never believe who Ethan is good friends with. I stuff my mouth with a taco. I'm sure Ethan knows a lot of high-profile people. Oh my god, does Ethan treat you like this all the time? I point to the food and the drinks. I already know the answer to that. He adores her, and she deserves it. Of course, he does, I mutter. As he should, or else. And why aren't you eating? We just ate a huge meal. I'm stuffed and still buzzed from the wine. We had a different one with each course. But that doesn't stop Tara from finishing her drink. I can't believe I haven't told you about last Friday. You won't believe what mother did and who I ran into. I put the word ran in air quotes before stuffing another taco in my mouth. 
damn, it's loud in here, I yell with my mouth still partially full. Oh, sounds juicy. Let me tell you this first. Like I was saying, since you watch basketball with dad, I tolerate basketball with our dad. I sit with him and look at my phone or grade papers while he watches. I do it because our evil stepmother refuses. And as many times as he's tried to teach me the basics, I have no idea what the rules of the game are. Most importantly, I do not care. Ethan returns, and Tara stops speaking. He's not alone this time. Next to him is the tallest man I think I've ever seen. He must be close to seven feet tall. With my mouth full of taco, I crane my neck and stare into his face. After leaning down and kissing Tara's cheek, he looks down at me. He has dark brown eyes and a mop of dark, curly hair on his head. His eyes are framed with thick eyelashes, and his eyebrows are kind of bushy, but they make him approachable. Otherwise, he would be too perfect. Too handsome. His face has about a day's worth of stubble on it, and I didn't realize I liked that look until just now. He looks familiar, and as soon as I hear a group of women calling his name and snapping pictures, it clicks, and whatever interest I had in him vanishes. He stands tall, waves, and smiles at the fangirls. I don't think I've ever been this turned off in my life. As handsome as he is, I remind myself that I'm all about black love. I turn back to the tacos and shove another one in my mouth. Tara jumps up and hugs him. Ethan playfully pulls her away and stands between them. The guy pretends to go around Ethan to hug Tara again, but Ethan blocks him. I wash down the taco and look around for Tamron so she can join us. Maybe this guy will enjoy getting his ego stroked by someone who actually gives a shit about athletes. Vicky, Ethan says, this is my friend and neighbor, Colt. Colt's height isn't the most disarming thing about him. His smile is, and if I wasn't sitting, I would have fallen on my ass at the sight. His full pink lips hide perfect straight teeth, and the single dimple he has in his right cheek should be illegal. Colt, this is Tara's sister, Vicky Taylor. His eyes roam my body, paying special attention to my breasts in the tight corset top, which pushes them together, making them appear bigger than they are. The joke's on him. He doesn't stop at my breasts. His eyes travel south, slowly roaming my bare legs. I almost have the urge to pull down my skirt, but I don't bother. He's free to look, but he'd better not touch. He extends a hand, and to show him I'm not affected by his face or his celebrity, I take it. I do my best to appear unfazed, but it's like a bolt of electricity has gone through me, and I'm grateful for the loud music that drowns the gasp of surprise that leaves my mouth. I try to pull my hand away from his, but he has other ideas. He lifts it and puts his full, soft lips on the back of my hand. Another gasp, and I feel my face flush, something that hasn't happened to me in years. When he loosens his grip, I pull my hand away and discreetly wipe his kiss on my skirt as if that would undo the jolt of lightning that's still surging through my body. Needing to gain control of myself and the situation, I feign ignorance and say, You look familiar. Do I know you? Are you an actor? His eyes light up at my question. He smiles deep enough for that dimple to make another appearance, and I eye his stubble up close. It's the kind that you want to run your tongue through. Forward for the Manhattan mischiefs, Victoria. It's a pleasure to meet you. I almost combust at his words. His voice wasn't what I expected. I knew it would be deep, but I was not prepared for the baritone. I stand abruptly and move to the edge of the VIP section to look across the room for Tamron. I get no reprieve. He follows and stands next to me, invading my senses with the scent of his cologne. A forward for the Manhattan mischiefs? What's that? Sounds like a lookout for a gang. His eyes light up with humor and the corners of his lips curl into a smile. Are you in the mob or something? He doesn't answer me right away. He signals for the server and orders a water with lime. Is that your subtle way of letting me know you don't watch basketball? Basketball? Is that what you do? 
I make a show of looking around the crowded club. There's a line of women and men looking and pointing at him. Two burly guys stand in their way. You're in the wrong section. I point to the group of women trying to get noticed by him. I think they're trying to get your attention. Vicky, Colt's son is Vincent's BFF, Tara says as she approaches. Vincent is Ethan's four-year-old son. My sister went from single to living with a single father and assuming the role of stepmom within months. I look at her, and I purse my lips in disapproval. She smirks and I smirk back. Message received. I do a small eye roll, determined now more than ever to get away from this guy. Athlete and single father. No and no. Stick a fork in it, it's done. Tara shrugs. Traitor. What's this now? Colt asks. What's what? I ask him. That look between the two of you. It's like you were having a conversation with just your eyes. Like you can read each other's minds. We can, Tara tells him. It's our superpower. And that look was about me, wasn't it? Colt's deep baritone gets closer. He's standing so close, his body is practically touching mine. I bet according to you, everything is about you, I tell him. Tara giggles and promptly covers her mouth with her hands. Ethan leans down and whispers something in her ear. She nods at whatever he says, and they both look up and laugh. Why am I not surprised? Ethan asks. Let's go dance and leave these two alone. He puts his hand on the small of her back, leaving me alone with Colt. So, he says close to my ear. I pull out my phone to text Tamron to join me in the VIP. Is that it? I'm dismissed? I look up at him, raise an eyebrow and look back down at my phone. What on earth are you talking about? I know exactly what he's talking about, but I refuse to admit it. I keep staring at my phone hoping he'll take the hint and leave. He doesn't. You learned something about me that made you dismiss me. Dismiss you as what, Cole? I open my email and go through it. Mostly junk. Colt, darlin' a dot. I pretend I don't hear him and continue to stare at my phone. He puts a huge palm over my screen. Colt, darlin', he repeats with more force. It's Victoria, never darling, I correct him. I move the phone, turn, and give him my back. He moves and stands next to me. Thank goodness I said darlin, not darling. So, what is it about me that turned you off? I was never in danger of being turned on. I look at him up and down. He's well dressed in gray pants and a light blue shirt. His hair's a little long, but the curls make him look youthful. Yeah, this guy turns me on, but he'll never know it. If I was into white guys, he'd be my type. Tamron finally answers my text and tells me she's on her way. He inches closer, and I take a step away. Let's see what it could be. He purses his lips and pretends to be deep in thought. Me being a basketball player was strike one. That was obvious from the way you pretended not to know who I am. I arch an eyebrow at his smug arrogance. As if I'm supposed to know who you are? Everyone in this city knows who I am. I've brought you four championships. You alone? I might not understand the rules of the game, but I'm pretty sure it's a team effort. I guess it's good to know you take all the credit. I turn from him and head in the opposite direction. I don't make it two steps before he's standing in front of me, blocking my path. Don't try and distract me. Let's see. Where was I? I was still in the game despite being an athlete, but then your sister let it drop that I have a son. When you learned that you rolled your eyes, and I was out. Am I on the right track? Not even close. Astute bastard. Nothing about that exchange with my sister was about you. Check your enormous ego. I think someone is lying thought. What possible reason would I have to lie to you? I let out an undignified snort. 
He takes a small step closer, and I'm forced to look up at him. You want to prove you're not interested. He leans down close to my ear, and I want to take a step back, but I won't give him the satisfaction of knowing how much he's affecting me. That tempt in the mouth of yours says one thing, but your body tells me something else. He stands straight and steps away, and I do my best to control my rapid breathing. Just the feel of his breath along the shell of my ear has sent my entire body on fire. Except I have nothing to prove, especially not to someone I've known for five minutes. I look around for my sister only to find her in the corner dancing with Ethan. Enjoy your evening, Cole. I take a step, but he stands in front of me, once again blocking my path. I arch an eyebrow and wait for him to move. Only he doesn't. All he does is smile that devilishly sexy smile. It's Colt, darlin', but you already knew that too. Everyone knows it. I told you, it's Victoria, not darlin'. And is that a southern twang I hear? He steps closer, crowding me a bit, but I refuse to step back. Alabama boy, born and bred. A true southern gentleman. I cock my head to the side. Alabama? You don't say. That's a definite hell no. Is that strike three? Do you have problems with Alabama boys too? Not yet. If someone had dumped a bucket of ice water on me, it couldn't have done a better job of turning me off than this little revelation. I probably would have learned this if I paid any attention to those stupid basketball games I torture myself with just to spend time with my father. Good. In that case, do you want to dance? My daddy used to tell me to always ask a pretty lady to dance. He smiles, making him look playful and boyish. For a second, I imagine dragging him to a far corner of the club for a slow dance, but I think better of it. He's a friend of my sister's man, and I don't think Ethan is going anywhere anytime soon, if ever. He's an athlete and judging from the people taking pictures and videos of this interaction, he's a popular one. I like my quiet life, and I remind myself, when I'm ready for a relationship, I'm all about the black love. No, I don't. I try to step around him, but he continues to block me. There are lots of pretty ladies for you to dance with. How about another drink, he asks, ignoring my comment about finding someone else. I've had my fill, but I'm sure any one of them would love to join you. Maybe you can order yourself another water with lime. I point to a group of ogling women a few feet away before giving the water in his hand the side eye. I'm not a drinker. Never have been. He looks down at me, particularly at my breasts, and licks those full lips of his. He inches closer, and I have no choice but to take a step back. Only, it's not just a step, it's a jump, and I resent the smug smile he gives me. And I don't want any of them, he whispers before feasting his eyes on my cleavage. He inches closer. I only want you, despite how judgmental you are. We always want what we can't have, don't we? I wonder why humans are wired that way. Huh? I guess we'll never know. I shrug and give him my back as I walk away. He surprises me when he throws a casual arm around me. Let's discuss. Though, that's not really a difficult question, darlin', he exaggerates the word, but I'll go with the most obvious answer. It's to fulfill a fantasy. Do you have any fantasies I can help you fulfill? His accent gets thicker with each word. It's almost musical. I stop walking and he stops too. I crane my neck to look up at him, and even in my five-inch heels, I feel like an ant next to him. Those are two separate questions, Cole. Let me break them down for you. His eyes light up and he says, please do. Do I have any fantasies? Yes, lots. Can you help me fulfill any of them? I look up at him and get on my tippy toes, cursing at the fact that he's so damn tall. I lower my voice and whisper, not a single one. I tap his shoulder and resume my walking, but he walks along with me. Not close enough to touch, but close enough for me to feel the heat emanating from his body. Vic, how the hell did you get in here? 
I nod to the server to let Tamron in. Her mouth opens and her jaw almost hits the floor when she sees Colt. Holy shit. Is that Colt Chastain? It is. Cole, this is Tamron, and she's a huge fan. Tamron, do you want to dance with him? Tamron doesn't utter a single word. She stands and stares at him with her mouth wide open. I take a step closer to him, making sure that our bodies don't touch. Be a gentleman, Cole. Don't leave a pretty lady Hanjin, Darlin thought. I exaggerate a southern accent to get my point across and walk away, but I feel his eyes on me. As much as I pretend not to notice, I do. And as much as I don't want to be affected, I am. 4. Colt After introducing Tamron to my teammate Jarvis Jones, I escape. If Fangirl had a face, it would be Tamron. I know her type. She wants to be with a professional athlete, and it doesn't matter which one. She was as happy to be on Jarvis's arm as she was when she wrapped herself around mine. I didn't want to be out tonight. I had to be dragged out by my teammates, and since my son is with his grandma, I had no excuse. Now, I'm glad I did. I never look to meet women at clubs, but tonight is a pleasant surprise. Vicky was the first thing I noticed when I got here. All I saw was a nice ass and an incredible pair of legs. I recognized those legs the instant I walked into the VIP section. She was sitting on the chair like she was a queen on her throne. She has an air about her, as if she's above everything. I imagine those bare legs on my shoulders while I have my head between her legs, but it was her face that almost made me fall over. Beautiful, smooth brown skin. She has high cheekbones and lips so full I know I can spend days kissing her. She has a cute little nose and big eyes, surrounded by thick and long eyelashes. I look around the club and find Ethan dancing closely with Tara in the corner. When he finally looks up and catches my eye, I tilt my head and gesture for him to join me. He leaves Tara, and she runs to the ladies' room with Vicky, who makes a point not to look in my direction. I can't help but admire the way her tight skirt hugs her ass. That perfect, round ass. She's not a big woman, only a little taller than her sister, but her body is tight and lean, yet also soft and pliant. And those legs. I'm counting the days until I can run my hands freely over those legs. I stare at her ass until she turns a corner and out of my sight. Jesus, the things I can do to that ass. Ethan's sharp elbow jab in the ribs brings me back to reality. I ignore his smirk and gesture for him to follow me back to the bar. I'm almost tempted to order a drink, but I get another water instead. How did you get a woman like Tara? I ask him. You lucky son of a buck. The one attempt at a relationship I had after my wife died traumatized my son and left me jaded. That's one of the things Ethan and I bonded over. Both of us single fathers trying to raise our boys without their mothers and wading through a pool of women to find one who accepts that we're a package deal. What the hell is that supposed to mean? He takes his drink from the bartender and downs it. I remember the last time you had a date, I remind him. Oh, shut up. He visibly cringes at the memory. I don't consider that a date. And you better not say anything about that to Tara. I let out a loud bark of laughter. Relax. That was way before she came into your life. And what about that strawberry blonde I saw you eating with all those months ago? I laugh at the angry glare he gives me. Obviously, I'm not into strawberry blondes. And it was business, and that was enough. Exactly my point. You were more anti-dating than me. Well, things changed when I met Tara. I look around the club, and when I don't see Vicky, I lean closer to Ethan and say, what's the deal with her sister? Tough nut to crack, but nice. Loyal to a fault. All the tailors are loyal like that. Put in a good word for me. He raises an eyebrow at me. What? All you have to do is step outside and women throw their panties at you. You don't need me to say anything for you. 
I down my water and request another. Usually, but she's different. I don't think she cares about me being an athlete. In fact, I think it annoys her. That sounds like Vicky. Is she with someone? Don't think so, but even if she is, she doesn't strike me as the type who would invite him over for Sunday dinner. Ah, I say, raising an eyebrow. The type to make you work for it. I should have known she doesn't have a man. He'd be crazy to let her out looking like that by herself. Ethan puts down his drink, sighs and shakes his head. Did you see her legs? Jesus. Word of advice. Nobody lets the Taylor women do anything. Remember that. That southern gentleman thing that you do won't work on her. I throw my head back and laugh. You New Yorkers, I say with my best southern drawl. I do declare, this is no act. You Yankees kill me. Yeah, good luck with that. And what happened to your, he tilts his head until he finds the right word, arrangement. That's over. After my attempt at a relationship imploded, I made a different arrangement with someone. It was purely physical and lasted less than two months. It became mechanical. Those early days when I was able to screw without an emotional connection are gone. Ethan says something, but I don't hear any of it. Vicky and Tara return and walk back to the VIP section, and I follow those legs the entire way. A couple of guys follow, and Vicky waves them in. A set of twins approach, both tall, dark, and bald. They sit on either side of the women. It's like Ethan has radar. He slowly turns around and sighs at the sight before him. I'd laugh if their presence didn't make my stomach turn. I wonder if the twins are more her type. It makes sense that a black girl from New York City wouldn't be interested in a white boy from Alabama. Every fucking time I turn around, he sighs. Ethan puts down his glass and leaves my side without another word. Once he approaches, he offers Tara his hand and escorts her out of VIP and into a secluded corner. He puts his forehead on hers and says something I can't hear. I look away, feeling like a voyeur during an intimate moment. I never use my celebrity to get what I want. I pay my own way, and I follow the rules. Except now. Their reaction is exactly what I want when I step in. They both stand when I approach. Definitely two beta males. No way would I stand for another man, especially when I'm next to a beautiful woman. Victoria stands along with them, but unlike them, it's not because she's in awe of my presence. She crosses her arms and narrows her eyes at me. Both guys hand me a napkin, which I'm happy to sign. We take a few selfies and I shake their hands. You see that room? I point across the hall. There are six of my teammates in there. I'm gonna send a text so you guys can get in. What are your names? While they tell me their names, I send one of my teammates a text. The twins practically run away just like I wanted. I turn back to Vicky and smile in victory. I take it a bit further and wink. She crosses her arms and looks into my face. It's fascinating to watch. She's doing her best to hide any emotions, but I can tell she's annoyed. It's in the way she blinks rapidly and the distinct rise and fall of her chest. She tilts her head to the side as if she's just decided on what to say and says, You should know something about me. Pretty soon, I'm going to know everything about you. She ignores that statement. What you just did, I don't find that cute or endearing. That's the first thing. She tilts her head up and points a finger in my face. I try hard to hold my laugh but fail. I recover quickly though and wipe the smile off my face, but the idea of this woman who barely reaches my chest trying to chastise me is the funniest thing that's happened to me in a long time. Fascinating dot. I do my best to pretend to be odd. What's the second tang? The second thing is, you're boring. Controlling wannabe alpha males bore me. Goodbye. She turns and walks away.
I admire the curve of her ass and the swing of her hips before I catch up with her in two long strides. I walk past her, turn around, and block her path. She stops before she can collide with my chest. We didn't finish our conversation. I did. She does a fake pout and purses her lips together. Then something changes in her eyes. She inches closer to me and bites that plump bottom lip. On second thought, I want to ask you something. She whispers the words and I feel a stirring in my pants. She gestures for me to lower down, and I do, putting my ear close to her lips. Tell me something. Her words come out husky. I'll tell you anything you want to know, darling nut. Her small hands glide across my pecs, slowly massaging me over my shirt. I flex underneath her hand. She whimpers. Have you ever, she stops herself and looks around, almost as if she's too shy to ask. Have I ever what? You can ask me whatever you want. Have you ever had a five-inch stiletto lodged in one of your testicles? All shyness gone from her voice, she shoves me away, and I practically fall on my butt. I run ahead of her and block her path, make a face and wince. Can't say that I have. I hope you're not into that kind of thing. I mean, I don't mind a little bit of pain, but... Keep blocking me, and you'll find out. I throw my head back and laugh while I try to imagine that. I'm positive I can lift her with one hand without exerting much energy. I'll have my hand wrapped around her wrist before she can take her shoe off. The last woman who threatened me was my mama, I tell her. That statement doesn't impress her either. She makes a face and turns away to walk in the other direction, but I grab one of her wrists. She twists and turns to get it away from me, but I put my free hand in my pocket and wait. I even whistle a tune while she tries and fails to pull away. Don't tire yourself out. Let me go, she commands, and I drop her wrist. Come on, don't go. This is the most fun I've had in years. She gives me a look of disbelief, and I give her my best smile. She thinks I'm toying with her, but it's true. I surprise her when I throw an arm across her shoulders. Let me get you another drink. I flag the waiter down and ask him to bring her the same thing she just had. Keep me company. I spin her around and take her in my arms. See that? Perfect fit. Do you know what I think we should do? I'm sure you'll tell me, Cole. To my surprise, she doesn't try to move away. Her lithe little body fits perfectly into mine, and despite the extreme height difference, it's not awkward. You should tell me all the things you find distasteful about me now, and I'll do the same with you. Let's just get it out of the way. Someone stands outside our section and snaps pictures of us. Vicky quickly hides her face in my chest, and as much as I like the feel of her against me, I don't like the reason she's doing it. I shake my head at the man taking pictures, but he doesn't move until security pulls him away. I don't think we have enough time. In the short time that I've known you, I found a lot of distasteful things about you. In fact, I can't think of a single good quality about you. She smiles into my face when she says that. I'll go first. She jerks her head back as if she's surprised. What? You can't possibly be shocked that I would find something wrong with you. I am, as a matter of fact. How dare you, Cole? You're withholding that. She scoffs, but her face lights up. She appears even more beautiful in her unguarded state. I want to pat myself on the back for finally making her laugh. You're annoying, she retorts. You can't take a hint. We're supposed to be taking turns. That's another thing I find distasteful about you. You can't seem to follow the rules, and as the primo athlete that I am, I can't abide by that. She's uncomfortable with my job, but it's what I do, and there's no point in pretending otherwise. Whose rules, she asks. Yours? Mine? I reluctantly pull my hands away from her and point to myself. I pull her back into me before she can run away. 
Oh, you mean mine as in the patriarchy? Never. I don't make the rules, but I do play by them. So, that's another thing I find distasteful about you. You cheat at games. She rolls her eyes and does a loud, fake yawn. You don't know me well enough to make any of those statements. But I'm right. You're full of yourself, she tells me. You're a liar, I say back. There's no possible reason for me to lie to you. Ever. And you're a terrible actor. You like the sound of your own voice too much, she tells me. You live in a cloud of denial by pretending you don't want me. Oh, Cole, she says, looking into my eyes. Delusional much? And I could never be with you, I tease, pulling her closer and we sway. We look totally ridiculous slow dancing to the fast song that's playing. Well, we finally agree on something. That's the one and only thing we have in common. I have about a million reasons why I could never be with you, but I can't imagine a single reason why you wouldn't want to be with me. Because women fall at your feet? Every time I leave the house. Just as the words leave my mouth, a woman walks by and snaps a picture of me. She sighs and the smile leaves her face. The playfulness is gone now. Here are the facts, okay? I'm only going to say them once, so listen up. She looks up and gestures for me to lean down. When I do, she puts her lips so close to my earlobe that they almost touch. 1. She whispers, I don't date athletes. 2. I don't date men with kids, especially the type of man who's at the club instead of at home with their child on a Friday night. I put a hand to my heart and pretend to swoon. Be still my heart. I exaggerate my southern accent as much as possible and channel mama on a Sunday morning after she sees us dressed for church. A woman who is protective of my son. I'm going to overlook how you're judging me without all the facts. Maybe now there are only half a million reasons why I can't be with you, darling. Keep going. You're knocking down all my walls. She stares and opens her mouth, but no words come out. She tilts her head to the side as if she's gathering her thoughts. I pat myself on the back for winning this round and striking her speechless, but my own smile is wiped from my face when she slides her hands up my chest and grabs my shirt with both hands. She pulls me down. She's about as strong as a fly, but I lean down if only to be closer to that mouth of hers. You think you're so charming, don't you? My wide smile is the only answer I give her. Those words stick to your tongue like honey. You're the only honey I want on my tongue right now. She ignores my last statement and tightens her fists around my shirt. She pulls me down further. Number 3. Pay attention. I'm only human, Queen Victoria. How do you expect me to pay attention when you have your hands on me like that? And that perfect body of yours is so close to mine. 3. You're not equipped to ride this ride. And with that, she shoves my chest and lets me go. She walks away without another glance. I watch her ass the entire time. A few other men do the same. She finds Tara and Ethan, and I go to the bar for a bottled water. By the time I catch up with them again, they're on their way out of the club. Not surprisingly, when I offer her a ride home, she turns me down and leaves with her sister and Ethan, but not before I put the bottle of water in her hand. I'll see you soon, Victoria Taylor. She puts her free palm in my face and walks away without a word. I watch her bare legs and wonder what her skin would feel like underneath my fingertips. I text my driver and meet him outside a few minutes later. I don't bother saying goodbye to any of my teammates. They dragged me out tonight, and since Evan is spending the weekend with his maternal grandmother and half-sister, I decided to leave the empty apartment for a few hours. It's hard to believe that I live in a 4,000-square-foot Manhattan apartment overlooking Central Park. The house I grew up in was less than half the size of where I now live. Mama still owns it. Paying off the mortgage was the first thing I did when I got my first paycheck. It sits empty, still fully furnished from when we all lived there. 
I make it a point to visit every time I go home. As sad as it was those first few years without daddy, some of my best memories take place in that house. I don't think we'll ever part with it. Mama struggled to keep me and my brother clothed and fed, and as two boys well over six feet tall, we were always hungry. She did the best she could, sacrificing time and money so me and Charlie could play sports. He wanted to play baseball, but she couldn't afford the equipment, so we both ended up playing basketball. Out of the two of us, he was the more gifted athlete. At least that was the case when we were both in high school. Until a decision he made took it all away from him. That was only the beginning of the rift between us. By the time I get home, I'm tired and ready for bed. It's been three years since Kelsey died. Evan had just turned two the week before. All he has of his mother are pictures and stories told to him by his grandmother. All I have left is guilt. Guilt for not being in love with my wife. Guilt for thinking she got pregnant on purpose. Guilt for wanting out of the marriage. Guilt about talking to a lawyer behind her back because I did not want to lose custody of my son. When Kelsey died a week after I left the lawyer's office, my entire world came to a standstill. My son's life would never be the same, and his sister, Mia, was taken away from him. Her father has custody, but she spends a lot of time with her grandmother and Kelsey's sister Robin. Unbeknownst to her father, I still support her through her grandmother. It was an arrangement we made soon after Kelsey died when I realized I'd be losing custody. The house is lonely without Evan. All he's ever known is the two of us, other than a bad attempt at a relationship last year with a woman who was only interested in me. Since that relationship ended, Evan's gotten clingier, almost as if he's scared to have me out of his sight. Away games are stressful, but when I leave behind my crying son, it only heightens my anxiety. The only places he'll go without me are his grandmother's and Ethan's penthouse to spend time with Vincent. Since Tara's moved in, he's been spending more time there with his friend. He talked about her for days after spending time upstairs. Though I had met her briefly before, I had to go and see for myself one night. My son was right. She genuinely loves spending time with Vincent, and by extension Evan. It's made me want to give him a home with a woman who loves him and wants to spend time with him, but that's almost impossible to find. It's akin to finding a needle in a haystack or a unicorn. The ones I come across tend to want me because of what I do, not because of who I am. With a young son, I don't have the time to weed out the good from the bad. I owe it to him and to myself not to make the same mistake twice. I strip out of my clothes and drop in the middle of my empty bed before checking my phone. There's a text from Evan from several hours ago. He's sitting on the couch with his half-sister, both smiling into the camera. 5. Colt. Where did you say you are? I toss the towel from around my waist and throw it in the corner of my bedroom. My future in-laws. In-laws? You popped the question already? I barely have time to put my underwear on before Evan comes running into my bedroom. Is the ring ready yet? Daddy, I'm bored, Evan whines. Not yet. Long story. Her dad's a big fan of yours, and I. I cut him off with my laughter. And you need me to get in good with your girl's daddy. She's a bit of a daddy's girl. Evan climbs on my bed and jumps into the pile of clothes on the floor. I pick him up and throw him over my shoulder. He kicks his legs and giggles, squirming like a fish. Is her sister there? I'm suddenly eager to do my friend this favor. I'd do it whether Victoria was part of the package or not, but I haven't been able to stop thinking about her since I saw her at the club almost a month ago. She's like a ghost. She's not on social media and Tara refused to give me her phone number. She's a bigger daddy's girl than Tara. Of course, she's here for her family's Memorial Day barbecue. I never would have pegged her for a daddy's girl, but I can certainly work with that, especially if he's a fan. That works in my favor. Text me the address. I'll be there.
I end the call and toss my phone on the bed. I take Evan from my shoulder, spin him around the room and throw him on my bed. Let's get you dressed, son. I'm taking you to see Vincent. He jumps off the bed, wearing nothing but his Spider-Man underwear and a white t-shirt, and runs out of my bedroom. Come find me, he giggles. I sigh and prepare myself for a game of hide-and-seek. It shouldn't take long since he always hides in the same spot. We are dressed and out of the house in under an hour. It's a good distraction from my day. After an early morning practice and workout session, I have the entire day to spend with Evan. It's just a bonus to have other adults around. By the time we get to the Sugar Hill Brownstone, Evan is practically bouncing on his heels, and when Ethan opens the door and tells my son where Vincent is, he runs in and disappears to the back of the house. I look around my friend, and even from the front door, I can hear her voice. She yells something and laughs. It's a loud, unguarded sound, and I want to hear it again. I've thought about her voice almost every day since I saw her. She's out back, Ethan says. But that's not why I invited you here. He gestures me inside, and I lower my head to step over the threshold. Yeah, yeah. I'm here so you can suck up to your almost father-in-law. And mother's-in-law. Two of them, he says, lowering his voice. Mr. Taylor has two wives? He's the real baller. I guess even billionaires suck up to their woman's family. I look around the house. It's open with hardwood floors. I can see her growing up here. The walls are lined with family pictures, and I find Victoria. There's a picture of her in her high school cap and gown. She's smiling and totally unguarded and so different from the woman I met a month ago. That woman has her walls up a mile high. Here's some advice for you. You like Vicky? Getting good with her father and stepmom. It wouldn't hurt for you to befriend her twin brother either. He taps my shoulder and tells me to follow him. Ethan Bradford, nice guy, but commanding. I guess it's easy to be that way when you've always been sure of your place in this world. If being a CEO didn't work out for him, there are a million other things he could do, including doing nothing. He's so rich, he could do nothing for the rest of his life and still maintain his same lifestyle. Basketball saved me, and it didn't hurt that I was good at it. If I didn't have that, I might still be stuck in my small town working at a meat processing plant like my mother did. I follow Ethan to the kitchen, where he introduces me to Vicky's mother and their cousin Bernie. I see where your daughters get their beautiful eyes from. I kiss the back of her mother's hand, and she almost falls over. I do my best to exaggerate my southern accent, something I've found works well in certain situations. I do the same with Bernie, who is struck speechless. I wink at her and follow Ethan through the sliding glass door. This is where I find her. She's on the deck like a queen looking down on her kingdom. Her sunglasses are on top of her head with both hands on the deck rail. I follow Ethan down the stairs and into the yard, making sure to walk as close to her as possible without touching her. She jolts when I get close, and I claim a small victory. Her father, a tall man likely in his late fifties, becomes awestruck when he sees me. Ethan introduces me to him and to Alan Taylor, Vicky's twin brother. He's tall and skinny, and he looks more like Tara than he does his own twin. After asking them to join me in a friendly game, I take my shirt off. I normally would never do this, but she's still watching. As hard as our practices are, and as hard as my personal trainer makes me work, I'm suddenly grateful for it today. I'm lean but I'm fit, and my abdominal muscles are proof that I can lift weights with the best of them. I almost laugh when Alan copies me and takes off his own shirt. Alan, what the hell are you doing? Victoria asks from her perch above us. Alan puffs out his chest and pounds it with his hand. He flexes his stomach muscles. Cover that up. Nobody wants to see your bones. Women fight over this almost daily. He gestures at his body, and she rolls her eyes. I had two fighting over me just this morning. 
Who? Our mother and evil stepmother fighting over you again? They're women, aren't they? Alan asks. When her dad returns, he hands me a basketball, which I start to bounce on the small patch of concrete in their yard. You, Victoria says, pointing at me. I make a show of looking around the yard before pointing at myself. Me? Yes. You. She uses one of her index fingers to call me over. I take the few short steps and look up at her. It's Colt, darling Dot. She raises an eyebrow in disapproval at the endearment. If either one of them so much as breaks a nail, Cole. Her eyes narrow at me in warning. I give her a boyish grin, followed by a wink. When she scoffs, I blow her a kiss, and she takes a step back as if the kiss touched her. What happens if I break a nail? I tease. Have one of your fangirls bring you a band-aid. I toss the basketball to Alan and walk closer to Victoria. She looks down at me, her face completely stoic. Are you jealous, Queen V? The name is Victoria. Miss Taylor. If I'm nasty? I wiggle my eyebrows at her. I can be. I drop my head and do a dramatic bow. Whatever my queen wants. I am but a pawn in your. Oh, will you stop with the dramatics? Enough already. There's no one to fawn over you here. Someone throws the ball, and it hits me in the middle of my back, but I don't move away. I look into her dark brown eyes and lick my lips. She breaks the stare first, huffs, crosses her arms, and walks away. But she doesn't stay away for long. I start a game of two-on-one with her brother and father. Alan's a good player, and as tall as he is, a few inches over six feet, I still tower over him. He's a good defensive player, doing his best to block my moves and take the ball. If this was a regular game on the court with regular guys, he'd be competitive, but not with me. I might as well be playing with Evan and Vincent. I dribble the ball away from him and do a free throw, and I score. I turn to Victoria, who has now put her sunglasses on, doing her best to pretend she's not looking at me. We have an audience. Ethan's come out, as well as Victoria's mother. Her stepmother is taking a video of me playing her husband and stepson. Alan manages to get the ball and throws it to his father. We play until John Taylor falls on his ass and his wife calls an end to the game. His wife and daughters run over to him, and I put my shirt on. Our eyes catch again, but Victoria turns and walks away, calling the boys to go inside to frost cupcakes. I don't think Evans ever frosted cupcakes with anyone. His grandmother might dote on him, but she's not one to teach a young boy how to cook. I never thought he'd be interested in anything like that. We have a housekeeper and a cook, but clearly, he enjoys being in the kitchen. I'd love for my mother to be closer, but as much as she loves New York City, she'd never move here permanently. She loves the South, and she feels she's still responsible for my older brother, even though he's a 32-year-old man who has made his own choices in life. Why don't you join us for lunch, Colt? John asks. Stay as long as you want. Remembering what Ethan told me, I say, thanks, JT. He beams at the nickname, and I offer him a fist bump. Someone puts a bottle of water in my hand, and I lean back in my seat. So, we're hanging out this week, right? Remember, Bradford is paying, so we're getting the best stuff. Ethan laughs but it's true. Whatever he gets, it's always top shelf. From alcohol to food to clothes. Minutes later, Victoria returns with the boys, who take seats across the table from me. Both have chocolate frosting on their face. Did any of the frosting make it on the cupcakes? I wipe Evan's mouth with a napkin, then do the same to Vincent. Vicky let us eat one before lunch, Vincent confesses. She's nice. She told us not to tell, big mouth, Evan says, looking up at the heavens as if Vincent exasperates him. I try hard not to laugh. I eat a clean diet, especially during the season, 
and I make sure Evan eats healthy too. A cupcake before lunch is a very rare treat for him. We already ate it. What's he gonna do? Vincent shrugs. After his mother died, I worried Evan's childhood would be filled with loss and loneliness, until I realized it was up to me not to let that happen. We were older, but Mama was left in the exact same situation after Daddy died suddenly. The sliding door opens, and the rest of the family comes out, including Elizabeth, Ethan's sister, who arrived unannounced. Victoria and her stepmother bring out the food, and my stomach growls. The last time I had dinner that wasn't prepared by my chef was last Christmas when I took Evan to Alabama, and Mama cooked a feast. The food had been the highlight. My brother ruined the holiday, and Evan, Mama, and I went to Florida for a few days after Christmas to get away from the drama. That was the last time I talked to him. As if she can sense my thoughts, my phone vibrates in my pocket followed by my mother's ringtone. Excuse me, Taylors. I stand and go through the sliding glass door. I turn around, and Victoria watches me with an expression on her face that I can't read. I wink at her, and she yanks her sunglasses from the top of her head, shielding her eyes. Hold on, Mama, I say into the phone, but I don't take my eyes off Vicky. She's in a loose floral skirt that reaches her knees and a light pink tee. She has a wide belt at her waist, giving it a tapered look. Her outfit is complete with a pair of tan sandals. She's dressed modestly and that's what makes it so sexy. When I lick my lips at her, she abruptly turns around and gives me her back. Colton? I hear my mom's soft voice on the phone. Yes, ma'am, I say. The Yankee accent I've tried to perfect disappears whenever I talk to anyone back home. I woke up thinking about you this morning. Been praying for you hard, son. The whole congregation and your brother too. I look up at the ceiling and roll my eyes. She must sense what I'm doing because she says, it's true. He's changed. He's been busy with the new restaurant. Okay, mama. How are you? I know my attempt at changing the subject won't work. Mary Lee Chastain has made it her life's mission to heal the rift between her two sons, but how can you heal a rift that you didn't cause? We both played high school basketball. He was set to go to the University of Alabama on a sports scholarship until a fractured femur took it away from him. At the same time, my star was rising, and two years later, I was offered the same scholarship. Unlike my brother, I was able to attend and was drafted into the NBA two years later at the age of 20. Counting the days until I see you. I'm sorry about not coming to any games recently, but I want to stay close to home. That's code for I need to stay home and make sure Charlie doesn't start drinking again. I promise if you make it to the finals, I'll be there for all of your home games. She prattles on and on, and I listen with only half an ear. I look outside and Victoria is sitting across from my son, reaching over and cutting his steak for him. When she's done, she messes his curly hair. Charlie wanted me to thank you. No, he didn't. Why didn't he call me himself if he wanted to thank me? I think $100,000 to start his own restaurant is worthy of at least one phone call. I'd even settle for a text. But then again, maybe not. I wouldn't have taken his call and I wouldn't have replied to his text. And you're an investor, so that means you own part of the business too. Of course, Mama would ignore my question. This will be good for him, Colty. I think he's going to finally be okay, and if you have any ideas. I hope he'll be okay, and I don't have any ideas, Mama. I'm not in the restaurant business. I almost snap at her, but I rein in my temper. Mama is forever the optimist where my brother is concerned. And I'm not looking to be part owner. I don't want anything, but if this fails, I have nothing left to give him. In fact, I didn't give him the money, I gave it to you. If you want to be part owner, go ahead, but leave me out of it. She sighs, and I can see her now. Hands ringing and tears pooling in her eyes while she blinks them away. 
I bet she's shaking her head as if that would somehow erase the words I just spoke. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. I stop her before she goes any further. Mama, I don't need you to quote scripture right now. Please, stop. I raised you in the church, and I don't accept you turning your back on it. I don't need your permission to turn my back on any tang. That's just the way it is. I'm a grown man capable of making my own decisions. I immediately regret my sharp tone, but I don't apologize. You can't turn your back on your brother. Jesus died for our sins. We all have sinned. I wrote a hundred thousand dollar check so he can start a business. I paid for three stints at rehab. He lives in the house I bought for you. He lives a great life and hasn't had a job in years. Why do you think that is? Colt. No, I'm tired of this. And what has he done? He hates me because of things I had no control over. I didn't cause his accident. I didn't tell him to get drunk, climb a tree, and fall out of it. I didn't take his basketball scholarship away from him, but he's tried to take mine away from me. He tried to. He was not in his right mind when any of that happened. He was drinking, and you know how that affects him. How it affects the men in our family. I count to ten. Then I stuff the anger down because that will do nothing but mess with my head. My professional life might be going great, but my personal life has been nothing but a giant cluster for the past six years. I'm finally in a good place, and Charlie Chastain is not going to ruin it. Of course. Nothing is his fault ever. Look, Mama, I'm done talking about it. We are grown men now. You don't need to play mediator between us like you did when we were kids. I take a deep breath and change the subject. I was thinking me and Evan can come back to Alabama with you for a couple of weeks. And I bought another house there for me and my son. Mama doesn't know that yet. No need to tell her I won't be staying with her and Charlie. That sounds great. I can hear the enthusiasm in her voice. I want to spend some time with my grandson. The happiness is back in her voice, and I relax now that the conversation has veered to a friendlier topic, at least for now. Yeah, the little trader says he wants to play baseball. Can you believe that? She lets out a carefree laugh. You let my grandbaby play whatever he wants. The conversation turns to Evan and my plans for him this summer. She talks some more, and I look out the sliding glass door to find Victoria staring directly at me. Our eyes lock and she doesn't look away this time. You okay? She mouths. I don't know what I was expecting, but it wasn't genuine concern from her. I smile, but I know the smile doesn't reach my eyes. I nod, and she looks away, dismissing me again. I finally end the call with Mama and join everyone on the deck. Are you hungry, Colt, her mother, Alicia, asks several minutes later. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. I'm always famished after a conversation with my mama. I say it loud enough for Victoria to hear that I was talking to my mother and not a love interest. She hands me a plate and tells me to go help myself. I give her a smile and gratitude. Dad, can I spend the night here with Vincent? Evan runs to my side of the table and practically jumps on my lap. Alan says he will play video games with us. He says he'll teach us calculus because women love men who know math. Oh, really? Victoria says with a snicker. Where's your woman at, Alan? I'm more of a player, Alan says. One woman can't handle all of this. He stands, lifts his shirt and punches his stomach. Yeah, me too, Vincent says. Alan reaches over and gives him a high five. Um, no. We're not teaching them this, Tara says. Ethan, say something. He's four, baby. What do you want me to say? He has no idea what a player is. While Tara debates with her brother and Ethan, I glide my hand along Vicky's shoulders. She visibly shivers. My only white boy crush is Bradley Cooper, she whispers close to my ear. 
the smell of her musky body spray hits my nose. I lean closer and inhale. She gasps but doesn't push me away. I rest my forehead on her shoulder and say, in that case, it's time you upgrade to a man, Queen V. I rub my nose on a soft patch of skin, taking deep breaths of her scent. It's our first holiday together. Happy Memorial Day, darling Dot. I lean in and kiss her cheek. She bolts out of her chair and runs inside. 6. Vicky I barely take two sips from my very full glass of white wine when Mother, Tara, and my stepmother walk inside. I pour two more glasses of white and one red for my mother. Mother grabs me and pulls me aside, and I down my drink in anticipation. French fry, she says. She looks over my shoulder as if to ensure total privacy. Have you heard from Gerald? She drops her gaze after the words leave her mouth. I haven't thought about Gerald since that Friday night over a month ago. I'm sure you already know the answer to that since you're the one who told him where to find me, I whispered to her. I look around the kitchen, and Colt is looking at me from the other side of the glass door. I decide I'm going to ignore him too. I'm sick of men. I was only trying to help. She reaches up and runs a hand through my hair. You both were so young when you broke up. What's wrong with a second chance? I pull her hand from my hair and put it down. She shrugs and smiles, and I hate how her smile is just like mine. You're my daughter. The child who is more like me than anyone. I know you're lonely. I just don't understand why you've built this wall around yourself. She says the words tenderly, like a loving mother would, but they slice through me like a knife. Being like Alicia Taylor is not the compliment she thinks it is, and I take a small step back to try and regain my thoughts. Mother, I shake my head while I think of a response, let's stay out of my love life, okay? What about you? Are you dating anyone these days? Changing the subject back to her has always worked in the past. She's dated a bunch of men and was even married to one for a couple of years. She gives me a playful look, and I brace myself for a long story, but she surprises me. We're talking about Victoria. She puts her glass down and takes my hand. French fry, my therapist says, the sliding door opens and Colt and the boys walk in. Whatever mother was going to say dies on her tongue. Relieved, I pull my hand from hers. Colt walks by, making sure to rub against me while Evan pulls him down the hall. Mother's eyes widen at the interaction. Say what you will about mother, but she's astute. She's about the smartest woman I've ever met. Really, a uh, Vicky, she whispers before letting out a soft giggle. He's not exactly your type. She leans closer, bumping her shoulder with mine as if we're girlfriends exchanging secrets. I never would have thought. Why not? Tara is with Ethan. Yes, but Ethan is from New York City. Colt is from Alabama. She whispers Alabama as if it's a curse. Alabama, she whispers again. What are you saying, mother? It's okay for a black woman to date a white man if he's from New York City? Not that I'm interested in Colt, but her dismissal grates on my last nerve. There's nothing going on with us, I tell her. He's just a shameless flirt. I don't bother telling mother that Colt is only interested because I made it clear that I'm not. Oh, good because that would be a disaster. She lets out a shaky, fake little laugh. I look behind me and lock eyes with my sister. Knowing exactly what I need, she comes over and stands next to me. Tater tot, there you are, mother says. I was thinking you, me, and French fry can get in a good spa day. You know? The three of us like we used to do. Or four if Alan wants to come. I catch Tara's eyes and roll mine. I can tell from her stiff posture that she'd rather do anything else. Alan might be my twin, but the three of us are so connected. We can tell what each other is thinking without having to utter a single word. My stepmother, Cheryl clears her throat. She gives me a subtle nod, urging me to agree. 
like we used to do? I ask. When did we ever do that? I remember you trying to sell us on that fantasy last November. Remember that? When you bailed on Tara's birthday and decided to go to Barbados with friends instead? She sighs, and her shoulders slump. I stuff down the twinge of guilt that hits. I'm trying to make up for that. Tara and I talked. She's not even upset about it anymore. Why can't you let it go? She huffs and picks up her wine. And what about Cheryl? You made it a point to exclude her. I just want to have a few hours with my children. Cheryl understands. She waves in Cheryl's direction. Of course, I do, Cheryl says. It sounds fun. See? Come on. It will be fun, and I want to talk to you guys in private. She gives Cheryl the side eye. I have some stuff I need to get off my chest. I nearly scoff at that. Whatever it is, I don't want to hear it. The last time she tried to get stuff off her chest, she blamed our father for the demise of their marriage and Cheryl for the rift between us. And Ethan and I were just talking about it outside. He thinks it's a great idea. Well, as long as Ethan agrees, I sneer. Tara elbows me in the ribs. Ethan steps inside while typing something on his phone. He pulls Tara away from my mother and wraps an arm around her. I had Hunter book a spa for you guys. He'll email Tara the details. It's for up to six people, so have fun. Mother claps and hugs Ethan while Tara rolls her eyes at me. You get whatever you want. He pulls Tara to him and whispers something in her ear. I pull my mother to the side and say, Cheryl comes, or I don't. She pulls me to the other side of the room, away from anyone. I have no issues with Cheryl, she whispers. She has no issues with Cheryl now. Not since we've all made it clear that we won't allow her to disrespect our evil stepmother. But I would like to spend some quality time alone with my children. I told you I have things I want to say. We're her children too. And whatever you have to say, we've heard it all before. I don't think we need to hear it again. For a split second, I regret my words. She drops her head and her shoulders sag in defeat, but like always, she doesn't stay down for long. She stands straight and looks at me directly in the eyes. How long are you going to punish me, Victoria? For how long? Have you ever done anything wrong in your life? Have you ever thought for a second that I might have my own demons? She huffs and walks away without giving me a chance to respond. Chastened, I look at my sister, but she's busy talking with Ethan and Elizabeth in the corner. Colt returns and Evan runs outside to join Vincent and Alan in the backyard. Colt stands next to me, much too close. Queen Victoria, he whispers. When can I take you out to dinner? We've been through this. I don't give up. He puts one of his giant hands on the small of my back. A shiver goes through my body. He notices and smiles. My queen, my liege, he whispers. For some reason, I laugh at that. If I'm Queen Victoria, then we can never be. She married her cousin. He puts a hand to his heart and pretends to be shocked. Stop trying to get me to the altar. See, I knew you wanted me. He snatches one of my hands and puts it to his chest. I want to pull it away, but I leave it and feel the strong reverberations of his heart. His smile disappears when we lock eyes, and as much as I know that I need to look away, I can't. The playful flirtatiousness is gone and in its place is a look I can't interpret. The intensity of his dark brown eyes is so hypnotizing that all other sounds in the room fade away, and I lose myself in his eyes. I don't know what he sees when he looks at me, but I've never let anyone in close enough to fully see me. After a loud throat clearing, my mother nudges her way between us and announces, I want to have my children over for dinner soon. I want to get to know my daughter's boyfriend and his adorable son. Vicky, you too. Bring Gerald. 
When I give her a death glare, she waves her hand and says, or I'll call him. I'm going to help you. She floats away and approaches Tara and Ethan. She wraps an arm around Ethan's to get his full attention. Who is Gerald? Colt whispers in my ear. I look at him and stare, not bothering with an explanation. I didn't realize it before, but I think I'm a very jealous man, my queen. At least where you're concerned. I think it would be better coming from you. What the hell are you talking about? I walk away from him and pick up the bottle of wine. That I'm the one who'll be escorting you to the dinner party. Oh, please, is all I say. I refill my empty glass of wine and finish it in one big swallow. A dinner party thrown by my mother is about the last thing I want to do. Judging by the look on Tara's face, she'd rather face an execution squad than make small talk and pretend that Alicia Taylor is mother of the year. I'm fairly certain there will be no dinner party, so it's moot. That sounds nice, Ethan says. On behalf of me, Tara, and Vincent, we accept. My mother laughs with glee at Ethan's attention. Alicia Taylor, the consummate hostess. It wouldn't hurt so much if she was always a shitty mother, but she wasn't. She was attentive, firm but loving. She took an interest in us, often taking us into the city for shows and museums. She has a great appreciation for the arts and instilled that in us from an early age. We were blindsided when we returned home that Wednesday only to find her gone. It was as if our entire life had been a lie. One moment the five of us were together and happy, and the next, our father was a single dad doing his best. We didn't realize she had left until a few hours after we got home. The three of us liked to watch TV in our parents' bed before they got home from work. Alan would eat chips in there, which was absolutely forbidden. That day, he brought chips and fruit punch, and when he spilled the juice on the bed, I ran to the closet to get a fresh set of sheets. That's when I noticed all mother's belongings were gone. She never gave us an explanation. Not then and not now. From what I can tell, she never told our father why either. Nothing beyond being unhappy and wanting out. We could have understood if she didn't want out from us too. We barely saw her that first year. It was three months from the day she left until we saw her again for an awkward lunch at a neighborhood restaurant. I did my best trying to hide how excited I was about seeing her. I held my breath until I saw her standing at the restaurant. Dad hugged us, goodbye, and left, promising to only be a phone call away if we needed him. I remember crying and asking her to come home, but she told us she couldn't but would be better about seeing us. She took us shopping after lunch, and looking back, it was a cheap attempt at buying our affection to ease her guilt over her abandonment of us, but three kids who hadn't seen their mother in months ate it up. Alan cried when she dropped us off. He didn't want me or Tara to see him, but I did. He spent the rest of the day in his room with the door locked and refused to come down for dinner. That night, I curled into bed with my new stuffed animal and cried for hours. It was another month until we saw her again. Dad was juggling his business and raising us on his own. Tara thought it was now her responsibility to care for us, but that only brought the three of us closer. We were an impenetrable wall. The three of us promised to always be there for each other no matter what. We promised to never have secrets from each other, and we've kept those promises. We're each other's best friends. While mother schmoozes Ethan about a dinner party that will likely never happen, I tune her out and pour another glass of wine for my evil stepmother. I don't know how she did it, but she came in and loved three children who were not receptive to her. We went out of our way to shun her as best we could without our dad knowing, but she knew exactly what we were doing and never gave up on us. She's been our evil stepmother since I was 11 and Tara 13. She never had any kids of her own, and it wasn't until I was an adult that she confessed she couldn't. Her first marriage ended after her third miscarriage, but she still came in and loved us as if we are her own. Darling, I think I'm going to let you three have a nice day with your mother. You're our mother, too. 
and you love a mani pedi and a hot stone massage more than anyone I know. You're coming. I give her a kiss on the forehead and rest my cheek on her shoulder. We'll share an Uber. Uber? I'll arrange cars for you, Ethan says. Mother giggles like a 13-year-old girl, but her smile dips when she sees me standing so close to Cheryl. Tara's not allowed to ride in Ubers. I look at my sister and wait for her to react. Excuse me? I'm allowed to do whatever I want, thank you very much. He leans in to kiss her, but she pushes him away. Undeterred, he takes her hand and pulls her close. Everything except get in a car with a total stranger. That's why you have a driver. He gently slaps her ass. When you get yourself a man, you go all out, don't you, Tara? I wink at my sister. Her taste has improved a lot since she met me, Ethan says. While everyone laughs, Cole comes closer to me. Queens don't ride Ubers either, darling Nadot. As I think of a smart response, the boys and Alan come running inside the house. Daddy, I want to stay. Alan says we can stay up late. He can stay, Tara says. We'll be staying here tonight, so he's more than welcome to hang out. I'll take good care of him. Let me think about it, he says, and for some reason, it irritates me that he needs to think about it. Evan huffs, but he runs behind Alan and Vincent, who leave to go play video games. Don't you trust us? I whisper to him. He takes my wine glass from my hand, smells it and hands it back. Do you want a glass, or would you prefer something stronger? I ask, hating myself for wanting to know anything more about him. Mama says alcohol is the devil's milk. I raise both eyebrows, taken aback by the statement. Is that what Mama says? I put a hand to my forehead. Well, I do declare. What does Colt say? Oh, so you do know my name. Colt says he doesn't care for mind-altering drugs of any kind. That confirms it. Colt is lame. Darlin', I don't need drugs to alter your mind or make your body beg for more. What I have is 100% natural, and yours for the taking if you want it. He grins, showing off his perfect white teeth and that one dimple. Add the curly mop of hair on his head and he looks practically boyish, and so handsome it should be illegal. I already had that today. His smug smile disappears, and just to twist the knife, I add, and yesterday. And the day before. You're a terrible, terrible liar. But I won't punish you because of that. I've been saving myself for you since I first laid eyes on you. When Alan comes back here, can someone please remind him that he's a grown man? Dad grumbles, coming in from the outside. He was having a food fight with the boys outside until I told them to knock it off. Colt, honey, good luck telling Evan he can't spend the night, Cheryl says to him. I leave everyone in the kitchen and step outside. Elizabeth, Ethan's sister is in the yard having a heated conversation over the phone when I start to clear the table. Whoever she's talking to must say the wrong thing because she walks past me and goes inside, calling her brother's name. Minutes later, Colt comes out and starts to help me. Usually after a family gathering, the three Taylor kids will clean up. That's the way it's always been, so when Colt comes out and starts to help, I almost drop a plate. You don't have to do that. I reach for the plate, but he pulls away. You're our guest. I'm a gentleman, darling. And my mama raised me to always help a lady. I roll my eyes and turn back to the table. What makes you think I'm a lady? I ask him. That's rather presumptuous. Oh, I can tell. You might want to be otherwise, but that's who you are. He drops his plate and walks over to my side of the table. When I turn to face him, he puts both hands on the table, boxing me in. But I do want you to do very unladylike things to me, only not with the stiletto. And because I know you'll find it exitin, I can forget about being a gentleman once I have you naked and in my bed. He runs his nose along the base of my neck. What do you think about that? I can hear my heart beating fast. 
he's so close, all I have to do is turn my face a fraction and his lips would be on mine. I told you the other night that, he turns and one of his hands cut my jaw. I almost combust in my parents' backyard. You told me what, he whispers above my mouth. What did you tell me, darlin? I lick my lips while I gather my thoughts. That you don't exactly fit my parameters. He chuckles and lets me go. I almost stumble back from the loss of his touch. Look at me. I'm almost seven feet tall. I don't fit any parameters. Never have. I reach for a plate, but he takes my wrist. Why are you so skittish? His free hand caresses the small of my back. It's been so long since I've let a man get this close that I don't know how to react. This closeness is more than just physical. He's trying to get to parts of me that I've locked away. Parts that I won't ever let anyone get close to. He puts a finger underneath my chin, and his touch is warm, like a shock to my system. He tilts my chin up, forcing me to look into his dark eyes before running his nose on my cheek, almost as if he's inhaling me and can't get enough of how I smell. Why don't I take you somewhere? Hmm. His large palm rubs my hip, kneading the soft flesh. Goosebumps spread across my body, and I feel the gentle thudding between my legs. Have I told you you're beautiful? His question is soft. Easily the most beautiful sight I've ever seen. I thought so the second I saw you. Those pouty lips and those expressive eyes. You give it all away with your eyes. All I have to do is look at you. If he wasn't holding me in his arms, I would have fallen over. I've been told that before by men, but never have I believed it as much as I do in this very moment. I'm sure you've been with your fair share, huh? I shove at his chest, but he wraps his hands around my wrists. I'm not a big woman, but this is the first time in my life that I've felt tiny. Why would you assume that, he asks. I might not watch basketball, but I know all about athletes and their limitless supply of women. I've been in the league nine years, was married for two, and have been a single parent for three. That doesn't leave much room for skirt chasen thought. Skirt chasen? I say with a smile. Horan. Philanderin or whatever you want to call it. It's not just that, I tell him. I don't date men with kids. That's the biggest load of bull I've ever heard. The Taylors are a poster for the blended family. This week. You and me. Let me clear up some of your misconceptions about me. Colt, listen, the words die in my throat at the sound of little feet approaching. Dad, Alan says, Evan stops when he sees us. He turns his head and gives me a look like I just killed his puppy. He narrows his little eyes, walks over, grabs Colt's hand, and pulls on it. Come play with us. Alan says he can whip your butt at video games. He stands between us and pushes his father away from me. He said what? I giggle at Colt's fake outrage. Yeah, he said he's a video game champ and you're a video game chump. Colt makes a show of pretending to be offended. He puts his head down and shakes it. Then he pounds his chest with a fist. Did you tell him how many NBA championships my teams won since I joined? I told him four. I told him you can beat anyone at anything. Evan raises his hand, and the two high-five each other. I cover my mouth to hide my laugh at the seriousness on Evan's face. Come downstairs so you can beat him. Show him who the real MVP is. He takes his dad's hand and starts to pull him. I'll be right down. Evan stops and stares at me. Unlike earlier, he offers me no smile. The friendly little boy who inhaled a cupcake in my parents' kitchen is gone. He's studying me as if he's trying to figure out the best way to get rid of me. I know that look. That's the same look the three of us gave Cheryl the first time we met her. Can you come now? He drops Colt's hand, stands in front of him, and lifts both arms so his father can pick him up. Colt obliges and Evan rests his head on his father's shoulder. Please. 
Vincent's daddy is already down there. He's terrible at video games. You have to come downstairs and show him what to do. Go ahead. I can clean up. Besides, you two are guests. I can tell he wants to say more, but he walks inside with Evan in his arms. Tara comes out and starts to help. I see your sister-in-law's panties are still in a bunch, I say about Elizabeth. Whoever she was talking to a few minutes ago got an earful. She's not my sister-in-law, Tara says. She will be. Will you say yes? I ask her and grab the plate from her hand, staring into her face. Hell, yeah, we both burst into laughter and fist bump. She leans closer and whispers, but they just found out they have a younger brother. Their father kept it a secret. 7. Colt. Hey, Colty. It's Charlie. I got your number from Mama. I put the phone on the counter, pull my shirt over my head, and toss it on the bathroom floor. I wait for him to tell me how he doesn't need my help, and he's going to pay me back with interest. I want you to know that this is only a loan. I plan on paying you back every penny, plus interest. Sure, you are. Just like all the other money you've borrowed from me over the years. Anyway, thanks. The call ends without a goodbye, and I wonder why he even bothered to call. He never has before. I hit end and call Ethan's phone. He picks up and says, he's fine. He's making milkshakes with Alan and Tara. Stop being a helicopter dad. Where's Vicky? I ask him, wondering why she's not making milkshakes too. She's around here somewhere. We chat for a bit but he gets another call and we hang up. I finally conceded and let Evan stay. He's not the most social, but he feels comfortable at the Taylor house. Besides, I trust Ethan and Tara with my son. I trust them more than my own brother. After a shower, I slide my naked body between the sheets. My phone vibrates. It's a picture of Evan and Vincent. They're both holding a fancy glass filled to the brim with a chocolate milkshake. There's whipped cream at the top, and they're both sporting mustaches. I send them back a thumbs up and decide to message another member of the Taylor household. Me, it's Colt. The three dots indicating she's responding pop up immediately. Queen V, I never gave you my number. She didn't. She left her phone on the kitchen counter, and before the screen locked, I called myself and saved her number. Me, I have my ways. Come over. Queen V, can't. I've been recruited by my womb mate to help host the best sleepover there ever was. Me. Maybe I shouldn't have left. Queen V, I think you're too old for a sleepover. Me, I guess we'll find out when I have a sleepover with you. Queen V, keep dreaming. 8. Vicky. It's stupid, Miss Taylor. Why would they kill themselves for each other? They've known each other two days. This is the part of the job I love. When we go off script and the students delve into the material and tear it apart. While I think of the best way to respond, another chimes in and says, no way I'm killing myself over some boy. The ninth grade English class cheers, and a couple of the girls reach over and high-five each other. Boys ain't shit, someone shouts. The girls agree, the boys boo and I do my best to keep my expression neutral. That's not true love, a young girl from the back of the class shouts out. Maybe because it's written by a man. Juliet was so unhappy at home that she grabbed onto Romeo as a way out. It's a shame that her only option was marriage, which we all know was also doomed. My Aunt Rhonda's been married four times, and she still says men ain't shit. The class erupts, and I stifle my own laugh. Why are girls always popping that sexist dish? Romeo didn't have many options either, Desmond says. Like boys had it so good. It's not like he could bide his time until he turned 18 to get out. They were gangsta back then. And maybe Aunt Rhonda just has crap taste in men. 
Desmond stands and mimics dropping the mic. He runs around the room, high-fiving all the boys. Yeah, but, someone says. I start to speak up, to keep this discussion from going off the rails. Normally, I love when we go off topic and have a good debate, but we have a unit test to prepare for and I want my students to do well. Hold on, guys. The talking stops at the same time the door to my classroom opens. I almost fall over when Colt Chastain steps inside. His head practically touches the ceiling. All the kids go wild and jump out of their seats. They crowd around my desk and circle around Colt like he's the second coming of Christ. Holy shit, someone yells out. Colt is handed notebooks, which he signs. Phones come out and pictures are snapped, and all I do is lean against the wall and watch as he disrupts my class. There's no way anyone will be able to concentrate on the rest of the lesson. He makes himself comfortable and sits on my desk, flashing me a mischievous smile. Romeo and Juliet, he says, picking up the book off my desk. I'll be your Juliet, someone yells. A couple of people sit on the desk next to him and start taking selfies. That's how the next 20 minutes go. Total chaos inside my classroom until the bell rings, and I force the kids out so they won't be late for their next class. Once my classroom is empty, I close my door and look at my uninvited guest. He leans against the wall so smug that I fight with myself not to slap him. Good-looking bastard. How did you get inside this school? I ask him. They don't just let anyone in. And how did you know where my room is? It's a stupid question. The Manhattan Mischiefs have won four championship games in six years. They didn't win last year, but they made it to the playoffs and lost in the seventh game. Dad did nothing but talk about the loss for the next two weeks. It's stupid, Ms. Taylor. Why would they kill themselves for each other? They've known each other two days. This is the part of the job I love. When we go off script and the students delve into the material and tear it apart. While I think of the best way to respond, another chimes in and says, no way I'm killing myself over some boy. The ninth grade English class cheers, and a couple of the girls reach over and high-five each other. Boys ain't shit, someone shouts. The girls agree, the boys boo and I do my best to keep my expression neutral. That's not true love, a young girl from the back of the class shouts out. Maybe because it's written by a man. Juliet was so unhappy at home that she grabbed onto Romeo as a way out. It's a shame that her only option was marriage, which we all know was also doomed. My Aunt Rhonda's been married four times, and she still says men ain't shit. The class erupts, and I stifle my own laugh. Why are girls always popping that sexist dish? Romeo didn't have many options either, Desmond says. Like boys had it so good. It's not like he could bide his time until he turned 18 to get out. They were gangsta back then. And maybe Aunt Rhonda just has crap taste in men. Desmond stands and mimics dropping the mic. He runs around the room, high-fiving all the boys. Yeah, but, someone says. I start to speak up, to keep this discussion from going off the rails. Normally, I love when we go off topic and have a good debate, but we have a unit test to prepare for and I want my students to do well. Hold on, guys. The talking stops at the same time the door to my classroom opens. I almost fall over when Colt Chastain steps inside. His head practically touches the ceiling. All the kids go wild and jump out of their seats. They crowd around my desk and circle around Colt like he's the second coming of Christ. Holy shit, someone yells out. Colt is handed notebooks, which he signs. Phones come out and pictures are snapped, and all I do is lean against the wall and watch as he disrupts my class. There's no way anyone will be able to concentrate on the rest of the lesson. He makes himself comfortable and sits on my desk, flashing me a mischievous smile. Romeo and Juliet, he says, picking up the book off my desk. I'll be your Juliet, someone yells. A couple of people sit on the desk next to him and start taking selfies. 
that's how the next 20 minutes go. Total chaos inside my classroom until the bell rings, and I force the kids out so they won't be late for their next class. Once my classroom is empty, I close my door and look at my uninvited guest. He leans against the wall so smug that I fight with myself not to slap him. Good-looking bastard. How did you get inside this school? I ask him. They don't just let anyone in. And how did you know where my room is? It's a stupid question. The Manhattan Mischiefs have won four championship games in six years. They didn't win last year, but they made it to the playoffs and lost in the seventh game. Dad did nothing but talk about the loss for the next two weeks. I'm not on there much. And you haven't returned any of my DMs. I walk away and stand behind the chair at my desk, putting some more space between us. I need to know when the dinner party is. That's because we said all we had to say. Thought I'd come over here and take you out for an early dinner. He speaks as if he didn't hear my last words. I make the mistake of craning my neck to look at him. Damn him for being so tall, especially when I'm in ballet flats. I pull out my chair but don't sit down. He closes the small space I manage to put between us and sits on top of my desk. The space is too small for someone his size. His long legs practically reach the wall that holds my whiteboard. I'm not into the whole celebrity thing. And I don't go out with athletes or people with kids. I made that clear the night at the club. I clear my throat and square my shoulders. I'm not going to say it again. But I take a step closer to him. And yet here you are, a single father, chasing after a woman who's made it clear she's not into the package deal thing. Evan deserves better. I give him my back and reach for a marker. He stands behind me, takes the marker from my hand, and traps me between his hard body and the whiteboard. That thing you just did right there, he says close to my ear. That thing where you defend my son and put me in my place. You have no idea how sexy that is. Those big hands end up on my shoulders, and he turns me around. We have that in common. I don't date celebrities, athletes, or single fathers either. He smiles, showing off that single dimple. Athlete is my job. Get to know Colt. Right. You're just a boy from Alabama. Man, he corrects me. When I stay quiet, he says, Ah, I get it. What is it you think you get? I ask, looking into his dark brown eyes. Just like the night we met, he has about a day's worth of stubble on his face. I want to touch it now as much as I did then. His dark curly hair gives him a boyish look, much younger than his 29 years. The Manhattan Mischiefs just renewed his contract, for years for $300 million, and that doesn't include endorsement deals. Every time I turned on the television this week, he was in a commercial. He's filthy fucking rich, but unlike some of his teammates, he's not flashy. In fact, a few of his teammates tease him and call him Cheap Chastain. You New Yorkers. He does a bad New York accent, making it sound like New Yorkers. You guys think this city is the center of the universe and look down at everyone else. Especially a good ol' southern gentleman like yours truly. You mean New York isn't the center of the universe? I shrug and say, it should be. You don't deny it. Seems like you've already made up your mind. Who am I to contradict you? Believe what you want. No skin off my nose. I think you live to contradict everyone. I gasp and pretend to be offended. Wrong again. Again? So, it's not my southern heritage that offends you? I let out a loud laugh. My dad is originally from Columbia, South Carolina. We visited there every summer when I was a kid. I love the South, so you could not be more wrong. But there's still no way I would ever get involved with you. Oh, really? He wipes his brow as if he's relieved. Thank goodness, but just in case, you should know that I traced back my ancestry and I'm 1% Yankee. 
he puffs out his chest in pride as if that's supposed to be significant. Yankee? He nods, doing his best to appear solemn. Is that the word they used? Let's go eat, and then I'll take you back to my place and show it to you. Show it to me? I eye him up and down. I have a pretty good idea of what it looks like, and I'm not interested. I'm not hungry, I tell him. Are we going to be one of those couples? Bemused I take a step back to look at him. You'll be the girl who says she's not hungry and then eat half of my food? That's exactly what I do to Alan all the time. He's so used to it that he orders two entrees whenever we go out. We won't be anything because we'll never be a couple. Especially to a widower because there's no way in hell I can compete with a dead wife. The circumstances behind her death are unknown. The theories range from cancer to a brain aneurysm to a drug overdose. I think your sister said the same thing to the man she currently lives with. I'm not my sister. And my kid is really cute. He is, and he did everything to keep me away from his father, including sitting between us. He dragged his father away from me so they could go play video games in the basement with Alan. He even faked getting hurt so his father could get away from me and check up on him. He is, I agree. No denying that. I love kids. Kids aren't the problem. You're giving me whiplash, Queen V, but okay. Don't date me. Eat with me instead. I don't want to date you either, remember? His full pink lips turn into a frown. I found about a dozen other reasons why I won't date you. Eat and that's it? Why didn't you say so? I can always eat if all you're after is sharing a meal with me. You're buying, right? I'd never let a lady pay. Right. A true southern gentleman. You say that as if it's a bad thing. I'm not looking for a gentleman. I'm looking for a lover. One who sets my sheets on fire and then goes home after. One I don't hear from again until I'm ready for him to come back to my bed. One who has no expectations about being invited to my family celebrations. That's what I tell myself I want, but the reality is, I don't know how long I'll be able to handle such an arrangement. This guy is probably about hand-holding and long walks on the beach during his annual family vacation with the kid who hates me. But now that I think about it, there are no pictures of his dead wife on his IG. There's never any mention of his personal life at all, only workout videos and pictures of him with fans. He stands and corners me against the wall. He doesn't press his body into mine, but if I move away, I will have to rub against him, and he knows it. So, I do it. I rub against him, let the smell of his cologne invade my senses, and feel his hard body against mine for just a fraction of time. He groans softly, and just to show him how unaffected I am, I go the other way and rub against him again. A few things you should know about me. As much as I love Tara, I'm not her. Don't assume I want the same things she does. I'm not looking for a relationship, especially not with a gentleman from any part of the country. I'm not a wallflower, I whisper. I don't need gentleness, and I can pay my own way. Then I won't be gentle, he whispers so close to my ear that I get goosebumps. But you should know that I'm all man, and a man pays for his lady. The man part is obvious. As if anyone would ever doubt that. He has testosterone written all over him. Very obvious. His smile deepens at my words. But I will never be your lady. I'll never be your anything. It would be so tempting to be with him. I'd give him one night, maybe two. Nothing but dirty, nasty sex. The kind that leaves you breathless and aching in all the right places the next day. The kind that makes every inch of you sweat and leaves you slick between your legs. The kind that breaks your bed and ruins your sheets. He's beautiful. Just the way I like them. Tall, lean, and hard all over. But I can tell he's not the type of man who will walk away. And the fact that he's friends with my sister's man complicates it. 
I'd run into him, and I don't like to run into the men I invite into my bed. They are there to serve a purpose, not to become a permanent part of my life. Besides, I'm all about the black love. I need to keep reminding myself of that. I'll remind you of this conversation when we celebrate your first anniversary. Normally, I find confidence attractive, but not on you. You should go. I need to prepare for my next class, and I'm sure your son will be home soon. He has a nanny, he says. But he needs his dad. I speak louder than I intend to, and I turn and give him my back while I gather my thoughts. I clear my throat and take a deep breath. Colt's relationship with his son is not my business, but it wouldn't be the first time I've had to put a neglectful parent in their place. It's something I do quite regularly in my line of work. Tell me how you really feel, Queen V. He has a swimming lesson. Not my business. Deciding to shut this down before he says too much, I turn back to face him. You should go. My door bursts open. A group of teachers walk in and look around the room. Of course, word got out that he's here. I'm surprised it took them this long to barge in. The tension in the room lifts and Colt turns into the charismatic athlete that he is. In an instant, he smiles, turns, and signs whatever's put in front of him. Phones are taken out and selfies requested are granted. I sigh, turn to my whiteboard, and write the questions I want to discuss for the next class as more people filter in and out of my room. I tune out the questions and laughter, but Colt's voice, just like him, carries and is impossible to ignore. I admit, he's charming. He's made every woman blush and every man feel important. It's something I noticed about him in his commercials. He has a presence that's far more than just his pretty face. Once the bell rings, I turn to my full classroom and say, Okay, everyone, make room for my students. I point to the door, and the teachers hurry out, likely to get to their own classrooms. I can only imagine the crowd if Colt doesn't leave before the final bell rings. I'll just stand in the back until class is over. You promise to eat with me. He walks to the back wall, leans against it, and crosses his arms. You'll only disrupt my class. Go wait outside. The words are barely out of my mouth when my door opens, and my students walk through. Word must have gotten out. It's pandemonium when they spot my uninvited guest. Any hopes I had of getting through this afternoon's lesson are gone. The kids are going wild. Cell phones they're not supposed to have come out. A few of them go live on social media. Resigned, I sit at my desk and watch the scene in front of me. Five minutes. I'm going to give them five minutes before I take control of this. Colt signs autographs, takes selfies and answers questions. Once I've had enough, I clear my throat, but that doesn't get anyone's attention. I slam a desk drawer, and the class calms down, but barely. Class, come on. Settle down. We have a lesson to get through, I say above the talk. It's Colt Chastain, Ms. Taylor, a student yells out. We don't care about Shakespeare right now. I look over at Colt while he signs a student's notebook. Okay, guys. Let's give Miss Taylor the room. I'll be in the back. We can hang out for a bit after class, but you do your work first. Everyone is in their seats within seconds, and I turn to today's lesson. True to his word, he stands at the back, watching and listening to me the entire time while we discuss Macbeth. I do my best to put him out of my mind and focus on my students, but his eyes practically burn holes in the back of my head. Because of the disruption, the bell rings before I can get through what I had planned for today, and when the class ends, the students congregate around Colt. My door opens and other students and teachers walk in, crowding him for autographs and pictures. It's been fun, guys, but I have to go. Miss Taylor promised to eat with me. The class cheers, and I plan all the different ways I'm going to kill him for making that public. I ignore him while I grab my things, and the crowd in my room thins out until the last person leaves. 
You ready? He asks as if he didn't wreck my entire afternoon. He throws an arm across my shoulders. You want me to carry that for you? He takes my bag and slings it over his shoulder. 9. Colt. It takes us half an hour to finally walk out of the school, but I keep my arm around her the entire time. Her lips are pursed shut, and the smile she gives to the kids and her colleagues is fake. She hates the attention, and I get it. When I first got in the league, I hated it too. All I wanted to do was play, but everyone wants a piece of me every time I step outside the house. People in the city think they own you if you play for their team. By the time we finally exit the school, my driver has the door to my car opened and ready. A large group follows us from the school, and I block Victoria with my body. The only place she has to go is inside my car, and she does just that. I'm sure it's to get away from the group, not so she can have a late lunch with me. She exhales loudly once she's situated inside the car and away from the crowd. I close the door, and she turns and glares at me. She snatches her seatbelt and snaps it on with more force than required. When I try to slide in the middle so I can be closer to her, she holds up her palm, telling me to stay put. Let's get a few things straight, she hisses. A piece of hair falls on her forehead, and she angrily swipes it away. Yes. Let's. The smile I give her only makes her angrier. First, you don't come to my place of work and disrupt it. How would you feel if I showed up at one of your games and made a scene? You screwed up my entire afternoon. Furthermore, you want to come to my games? I smile deeper. She huffs and turns away. I can hear her quietly counting the ten. Why didn't you just say so? I will make arrangements. No, I do not want to go to any of your games. She enunciates each word to get her point across. I don't care for basketball. Do you know what else I don't care for? I'm sure you're about to tell me. High-handed men. High-handed men are the worst. I agree with you on that. Her head snaps back and the look she's giving me would have made a weak man cry. One time, when I was a boy, my. And that. She points a long index finger at me. I don't like that. My face? I pat my cheeks. I don't think there's anything I can do about this. I'm not getting plastic surgery for you, queen. Anything else but that. Your attitude. I'm done. She turns away from me and leans forward. Excuse me, she says to my driver. I'm Victoria Taylor. What's your name? I'm Dante Rinaldi, ma'am. Dante, can you please pull over so I can get out? I catch Dante's eyes through the mirror and subtly shake my head no. He looks away and says, sorry, ma'am. Too dangerous to pull over here. I look out the window and curse at the lack of traffic on East 128th Street, headed away from the high school. We come up to a red light, and she tries to open the door. Child safety locks, I say. Evan would always try to open the door as a baby. She huffs, crosses her arms, and looks out the window. These car manufacturers think of everything. You're really starting to piss me off, Chastain. Trust me. You don't want to do that. Consider me warned, but you did promise to eat with me. Dante drives through the Harlem streets, and my guest seats next to me. First off, I didn't promise. But you want to eat? Fine. Let's eat so I can tell you all the ways that you've pissed me off. She crosses her arms and stares out the window. She doesn't speak for the rest of the short ride. When Dante pulls in front of Melba's restaurant, he jumps out and opens the car door for her. She stomps past him and heads toward the restaurant. I run after her to hold the door open. That only makes her angrier. Southern gentlemen, I remind her. We're greeted by the hostess and seated at a secluded table in the corner behind a plant. It's after the lunch rush and before dinner, so the place is pretty much empty. 
I pull her chair out before taking my own seat across from her. She drinks her water and doesn't bother to pick up the menu. She seems to have calmed down from the car ride, and I do my best to hide my amusement. I've gotten so used to everyone falling at my feet, especially women, that I enjoy her obvious dislike of me. But there's more. Her eyes followed me everywhere I went when I was at her parents' house last week. I think she wants to hate me, but she can't. She wishes she could, though, which makes her angry. You want me to read the menu to you? I ask, trying to get her attention. I already know what I want. I come here at least once a month. The waitress arrives, a young woman who appears to be in her early to mid-twenties. She's a pretty black woman with big, brown eyes behind a thick pair of glasses. Vicky Taylor, the waitress says. Vicky's head snaps up, and she jumps out of her chair and takes the woman into a hug. They're about the same height, but there's something maternal about how Vicky holds her. She cups her cheeks and looks into her eyes. Tilly? You're all grown up, Vicky says. They hug like two people who haven't seen each other for years. I clear my throat, doing my best to gain her attention. Finally, Vicky pulls away. Tilly lived next door to us until she was twelve. Tara used to babysit her when she was younger. Tilly blushes at the memory. Her thick round glasses have polka dots on the frame, and she has her hair in a tight bun, but all the female staff have the same hairstyle. They talk for a few minutes. Tilly recently moved back to New York. You moved back to the house? Dad didn't tell me. I've been back a week. I saw them once. I've been busy painting and unpacking. I'm only working here until I start my job in a couple of months. A few people filter in and Vicky orders a French martini and the jumbo shrimp. I stick to water in the pan-seared sea base. Tilly walks away after promising to get together with Vicky and Tara soon. A few guys approach when they see me, asking for pictures and autographs. Vicky sits back in her chair, crosses her arms, and watches with a look of distaste on her face. Remember our first date when we told each other all the things we didn't like about each other? Her eyebrows shoot up to her forehead. First date? She does a fake laugh. When did that happen? Good point. This is our first official date. Do you always date women who are pissed off at you, Colt? It's happened before. Tilly returns with my water and Vicky's drink. She gulps down half of it in one sip and immediately orders another. How's your devil's milk? I ask. She eyes me, and I can see the steam practically pouring out of her ears. I'm an adult who enjoys a cocktail. I make zero apologies for that, and I don't see that changing ever. To prove her point, she finishes the drink and washes it down with her water. You're really beautiful. The compliment confuses her so much, it takes the wind out of her sails. She sits back and eyes me. That's what I want to do today, the opposite of our first, I think of the right word and say, meeting. When she just stares, I say, you are beautiful. You have these really big, expressive eyes and full lips. Sometimes you pout after taking a sip of a cold drink. You sigh dramatically when your brother says something ridiculous, which is often. Your eyes soften whenever your father speaks, but they turn icy whenever your mother tries to join in the conversation, which I don't understand. Your mama is sweet, other than trying to convince you to get back with your ex. I'm sure once she knows about us, she'll forget all about him. She stares some more, not offering a rebuttal. Your turn to say something nice about me now. See? The opposite of our first meeting. You're a controlling jackass, and you don't know squat about me or my mama. She uses a southern drawl inflection when she says mama. Tilly brings her a fresh drink, but she sips it slower this time. She also puts a platter of crab cakes in front of us and tells us that it's on the house. I think you misunderstand the assignment, Miss Taylor. That's really a shame considering your profession. I grab a fork, 
put a piece of crab cake on it, and offer it to her. She shakes her head and picks up her own fork. You're supposed to say something nice about me. I can't think of a single thing. She looks up at the ceiling as if she's deep in thought. Nope. Not a single thing. That hurts, my queen. I put a hand to my heart, and she rolls her eyes at me. Then something changes in her eyes, and she leans across the table. Let's go back to that first assignment. You're high-handed. I'm assertive and decisive. You try to hide your controlling ways behind your southern gentleman persona, but I can see right through you. I'd only control you in bed, I tease. You disregard my career. You have your driver kidnap me. And for what? I already gave you all the reasons why we can't be anything. Our entrees are brought out, and I pierce a stalk of asparagus with my fork. Tell me again what those reasons are. My memory isn't what it used to be. And all her reasons are bull. It's been years since I've been this interested in a woman. It's been almost a decade of being able to have any woman I want, and I know this one wants me. And try not to give me some bullcrap reasons this time. Who says bullcrap? God, you're boring, and just because you refuse to accept my answers does not mean they're bullshit. I wince at the expletive. Cursing was forbidden in my house growing up. Mama would get so outraged whenever one of us would cuss that daddy would take out his belt. He never used it, of course, and a few times, he'd laugh while he'd chase me and Charlie. She picks up a shrimp and bites it, and I wonder how her lips would feel wrapped around a certain member of my anatomy. You can be combative for absolutely no reason, I tell her with a smile. Okay, fine. Here they are again. I don't date men with kids. I don't date high-handed men, and I don't date celebrities. That thing that you do to get your way, to sweet-talk your way into a school and into my classroom, I don't find that endearing at all. So, it's not because you're not attracted to me. I knew it. I wink at her, and she groans in frustration. I am very attracted to you, too, but I feel like you're holding back on me. Let's hear it because I want to get to the stuff you like about me. Your ego is not the least bit attractive, and neither is your dismissive attitude. That's another thing we have in common. Your dismissive attitude is quite off-putting too. And when you curse. I don't like that at all. Her eyes widen at my last admission. You'd think I just told her that I eat little children for breakfast. The way I talk fucking offends you? I cringe. She stands and grabs her purse. I'm going to get my bag out of your car, and then I'm going to take a cab home. This has been a huge fucking disappointment. And men who tell women how to talk. That's an absolute fuck no. I stand and approach her before she can take a step and hold both of her hands in mine. I look down at her, and she meets my eyes. Dante went to run a few errands. He won't be back for another hour. I need my bag. I have papers to grade tonight, she insists. I pull out her chair and point for her to sit. Come on. Sit. We're making good progress. I can learn to live with your cursing. Just don't do it when you meet Mama, and drinking is a no-no too when she's around. She calls Tilly over and orders a third drink. I won't be meeting Mama. You're not interested in me. You just refuse to understand why I'm not falling at your feet. You like to be worshipped, and I worship no man. Nope, that's not it. I met this pretty, smart woman, and I'm fascinated. I have the feeling you're holding back on me. Are you not interested in me because one of us isn't black? I arch an eyebrow at her. She starts to cough, and I reach over to pat her back. That's not funny. And yes, I prefer to date black men. What's wrong with that? It's limiting, not to mention unfair. Unfair? To whom? To me, of course. Why would I care about anyone else? I'm a very jealous man, Victoria. I'm going to let you know that now. 
you are absolutely everything I loathe in a man. Controlling. Jealous. Preachy. Sanctimonious and staking claim to something that doesn't belong to you. I can work on those things. You want to know what else I am? Loyal. If I want loyalty, I'll get a dog. I let out a loud belly laugh. It's so loud, the people from a few tables overlook at me. You're funny. I like that in a woman. Listen, she says as if she's searching for control. It would never work. I'm not looking for a relationship right now. 10. Colt. She sits back and resumes eating. I study her from across the table as she dips a piece of shrimp in a creamy cloud of mashed potatoes. I keep a strict diet during the season and my sea base is good, but I'd give anything to indulge in potatoes. She wipes the side of her mouth and takes another big bite. I love a woman who's not afraid to eat. The last person I dated barely ate, and I don't think I ever saw her without being fully made up and dressed. Vicky isn't wearing any now, and she hasn't tried to fix her hair once since I barged into her classroom. She's without a doubt the most beautiful woman on earth. She was gorgeous the night I first saw her and the day I spent at her family's home. She's just as beautiful now. Maybe more so when she's completely unguarded. She figures she's already told me no, and I'll go away quietly, but there's something about her. Something that calls to me. Something beyond how she looks and how she feels in my arms. Well, I'm not going to enter into some scandalous affair with you, if that's what you're thinking that. She looks up, surprised and a little confused by my words. This, I say, gesturing at my body. You can't just have this and walk away. What on earth are you talking about? Are you going to eat that? She sticks her fork in my sea base and takes a small piece. Oh, that's good. Do you want some of mine? She points at her shrimp, and I can't help myself. I take one, drag it through the mashed potatoes and stick it in my mouth. It's buttery and garlicky, just the way I like it. I bet you taste better. She finishes her third cocktail, and I brace myself for a fight. If she asks for a fourth drink, I'm going to object, accusations of me being controlling be damned. Of course, I taste better, though you'll never, ever know. I can see a little color in her cheeks. Those three drinks have definitely hit her bloodstream. I promise you, I will. Then the three of us will go out for breakfast the next morning. Three of us? You're into the group thing? I figured you for a square. No cussin'. No drinkin'. Boren dot. She does a terrible southern accent. Tilly approaches and puts a pizza we didn't order on the table. In fact, pizza is not on the menu at all. The chef's planning a special menu for the weekend, and I remembered how much you like Hawaiian pizza. She takes our glasses and promises to return with water. You see this, darling? I point at the pizza. This right here seals the deal. There are only two types of people in this world. The type who loves pineapple on pizza, and the type who doesn't. We're on the same team. I pick up a slice and put it to her lips. Maybe it's because she's had three drinks, but she eats from me and moans. It smells so good, I eat two slices, knowing I'll pay for it at the gym tomorrow. You misunderstood what I said before. I revert to our previous topic that she mistakenly took for me suggesting we would have a threesome. We certainly will not. Misunderstood what? You know what? I don't care. Stop talking. You, me, and Evan are going out for breakfast in the morning. Unless you prefer we eat at home. Whatever you want. I'm flexible that way, but I'm not much of a cook, so you'll have to do it. I let the housekeeper and chef have the weekends off unless I'm having a party. She sighs and rolls her eyes, not offering me a rebuttal. Her dessert is brought out, and she eats the entire thing without offering me a bite. 
When Tilly delivers the check, Vicky pulls out a credit card to give to her, but I hand mine over first. Vicky offers no argument. A crowd of people walk in and see me. They approach, and I take pictures and sign autographs. While I stand between two older women, I watch from the corner of my eye as Vicky gets up from the table. I sign another autograph and run back in time to sign the check and leave a huge tip. I catch up with her just as she's pulling her briefcase out of my car. Dante stands next to her, holding the door open. She pulls out her phone and opens the Uber app. I take the phone from her and gesture for her to get inside the car. A large crowd starts to approach, and I see the look of defeat on her face. She sighs and climbs inside the car. I only take a few pictures before I join her in the back seat. My phone, please. She holds out her hand, and I put it in her palm. Dante, do you need my address? Already have it, ma'am, Dante says. She crosses her arms and looks out the window, doing her best to ignore me. I sit back while Dante drives us the short ride to her house. I have to get home after Evan's swim lesson, and we're supposed to host Vincent for a sleepover. Evan's spending the night at his maternal grandmother's tomorrow. I have a game on Sunday and will be away for five days after that. She finally looks over at me. I can tell she's talking herself out of saying something. She opens and closes her mouth three times until she finally speaks. Does your mother look after Evan while you're gone? Her tone is almost accusatory. Well, I have no family here. I raise both hands when she continues to stare at me. I have a nanny who stays overnight when I'm away, but we FaceTime every night I'm gone. She looks into my eyes until she finally nods, as if my words aren't acceptable, but will do for now. All too soon, we reach her building. It's three stories, and according to Ethan, John Taylor gifted each of his kids with a condo when they graduated college. It turns out he owns property, both residential and commercial, throughout Harlem, refusing to sell when the neighborhood started to gentrify. She thanks Dante for the ride, and I follow her inside to her door. I'll pick you up for breakfast tomorrow, I tell her. This isn't the type of question you ask a woman like her. No, Colt. I don't like the publicity. You have a child who needs all your free time and attention, and you and I would be like oil and water. I drink, I cuss, I make my own decisions, and I have no intention of stopping any of those things. She opens the door and I follow her inside. It's a very big apartment, likely having three bedrooms and two baths. The space is immaculate. There's not a thing out of place, and it's decorated in earth tones, but with splashes of color everywhere. There are fuzzy yellow throw pillows and blankets on her tan couch. The walls are lined with family photos, and there are fresh flowers in the living room. The kitchen has pristine white cabinets and marble countertops. She puts her purse and bag down and turns to me. What about this? I ask her. She rifles through mail on the kitchen island, doing her best to ignore my presence. I stand as close to her without touching as possible and wait for her to face me. What about what? I take her by the elbow and spin her around, lower my face and take her lips with mine. Hers are soft, and she tastes as sweet as the peppermints she keeps in her purse. I wrap my arms around her waist and pull her closer. She's probably the shortest woman I've been with in years. My wife was six feet tall, and the last woman I dated was the same height. I bend down, and she surprises me when she gets on her toes. Soft hands cradle the back of my neck. She tastes of alcohol, something I'm not used to, but it tastes delicious on her. I sweep her tongue with mine and she does the same. She moans in my mouth and presses her body against mine. As quickly as the kiss started, it ends, and she takes several steps away. She stumbles, and I quickly approach and grab her hips to hold her steady. Okay, champion. You've proven your point. I have papers to grade, and your son needs you. 
I'm sure you have practice or whatever it is that you do to prepare for a game. I step closer to her, but she walks away. I follow her to the fridge where she pulls out a bottle of water. I usually eat whole wheat pasta with chicken breast and veggies, but I don't have a game tonight. You want to come home with me? Her head snaps up, and her lips curl into a smile. She shakes her head and waves me away. You can grade your papers there, and my chef will make you whatever you want. She takes slow measured steps in my direction. I take an exaggerated step back and do my best to appear afraid when all I want to do is laugh. When there's just a sliver of space between us, she points a finger at my face. Do you just bring random women home? Do I need to remind you that you have a small child and that he doesn't need a turnstile of women? Whoa! I wrap her index finger in my much larger hand. Every time you open your mouth, you make me like you more. I bring her hand to my lips and kiss it. I do not do that. It's been a little over a year since I've tried to date anyone. She puts her hands on her hips and continues to study me. If I find out you're lying, she doesn't finish her threat because her phone interrupts her, and she digs inside her purse for it. Hey, Dad. Hold on a sec. She puts the phone down and approaches. I'm going to talk to my dad, then I'm going to grade papers and do some writing. Thank you for the early bird dinner, but heaven help you if I find out you're not doing right by that boy. She walks past me and opens her front door. Okay, Queen Victoria. I'm going, but I'll see you soon. I kiss her cheek and walk out of her apartment.